What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about antiarrhythmic drugs. There are so many of these, so much to talk about. I want you guys to stick in there with me, hang in there with me. I hope that at the end of this video, you'll truly be able to understand this and ace any questions that you get on your exam. If you guys do benefit from this video, it helps you, it makes sense, please support us. And one of the best ways that you can do that is by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, I really urge you guys, our engineer team works really hard to make some awesome illustrations and notes that are kind of built on this whiteboard lecture. So get those, follow along with me, and I think that it'll really enhance your learning experience. So check that out. We'll have a link in the description box below, which will take you to our website. All right, without further ado, let's get into antiarrhythmic medications, though. But I'm going to kind of get there in a second. <laughs> All right, so antiarrhythmic medications are pretty challenging when you look at them in the entire gambit of everything that we have to cover. What I think will really help us first is to cover a little bit of physiology. So we have to go back into that kind of anatomy and physiology part into the cardiac physiology section and really remind ourselves of the action potential. All the phases, all the channels, all the ions that are kind of involved in that phases so that whenever we start talking about these drugs and their mechanism of action, you'll know which channel, which part of the curve, which tissue of the heart it's actually going to be affecting. And that's really, really important. So let's take a quick second to go through that. So in the heart tissue, what I want you to know is that we have two types of like myocardial tissue. One of those myocardial tissues is the ones that conduct like action potentials. They either generate it or they conduct action potentials. In other words, you have, these cells have the ability to intrinsically depolarize themselves. They don't depend upon the nervous system. Because you know how when tissues, in order for them to kind of depolarize, the nervous system has to release neurotransmitters on them and they cause them to depolarize. These guys have the ability to do it on their own. And so they can intrinsically depolarize and generate action potentials throughout the heart. So those are called like your pacemaker cells, or your nodal cells, if you will. There's a lot of them. So they kind of start here at your SA node at the top of the right atrium near the superior vena cave of right atrial junction. So you have your SA node. What it does is it generates action potentials. And these, this is the primary kind of like pacemaker of the heart. So it'll send action potentials throughout the atria and eventually throughout all these atrial cells it'll eventually converge onto the AV node, which is a nodal cell right there at the kind of like the gateway between the atria and the ventricles. So you have your SA node, then you have your AV node. From the AV node, let's say that the SA node failed. It did no longer you know, generate the action potentials. The AV node has the ability to generate action potentials. But if it doesn't, it receives the action potentials and then conducts it through him down into the bundle of Hiss or the AV bundle. Then from the AV bundle, it goes into the right and left bundle branch. From there, it'll go into your Purkinje fibers. And so they have the ability to generate action potentials. So if one fails, the other one can take over. So your SA node is the primary pacemaker, but it'll send the action potentials through the AV node, through the bundle of Hiss, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje system. So it's important to be able to remember that, that our pacemaker cells are primarily going to be in kind of a sequential favor here, your SA node, and then it'll conduct action potentials that'll move down to the AV node, and then from the AV node, that'll go into what's called your bundle of Hiss, and then from there, it'll go into your bundle branches, and then from here, it'll go into your Purkinje fibers. So that's kind of the order of how this kind of information is sent. And for the significance of this, this will be the generator. So it'll send these action potentials from the SA node. He is the pacemaker of the heart. So he's truly the one that has the intrinsic automaticity, that term that we talked about. If he fails, the AV node will take over and it'll gain the ability to do that. If the AV node failed, then the bundle of Hiss would gain the ability to do that. If the bundle of Hiss lost it, then the bundle branches would be able to do that in the Purkinje system. I think though one of the most important things to remember is out of all of these pacemaker cells, the two most important ones that you really need to actually have some degree of survival and adequacy in life is you really need to remember your SA node and your AV node. These are the primary pacemaker cells. If you did lose your SA node and your AV node took over, you'd still be able to have enough to, to have a heartbeat adequately. But if you lost the AV node and you're depending upon your Purkinje system, that's not enough adequacy to be able to properly live. So it's important to remember that these are the two pacemaker cells. What we'll do is, is I'm gonna take a pacemaker cell over here. So I'm gonna look at AV nodal and SA nodal cells here. And I'm gonna take a piece of these tissues here. So I'm gonna take a piece of this SA nodal tissue, a piece of these AV nodal tissues, and I'm gonna zoom in on one of these cells. 
and look exactly at how the action potentials are occurring in these cells. So how does that work? It's really cool actually. Let's say here in this SA nodal cell or AV nodal cell, I have this really interesting channel here in orange. So this interesting channel is called a funny sodium channel. It's called a funny sodium channel. So sometimes we denote this as like IF. It's a funny sodium inward channel. What happens is this channel is usually always kind of like open. And what it does is it allows for sodium to trickle in to these actual SA nodal cells and AV nodal cells. So the sodium will trickle in to this actual pacemaker cells. And if it does, it'll bring some degree of positive ions into the cell. Now, why is that important? Well, if we look here at a graph, this is going to be a graph representing the pacemaker cells, the SA nodal and AV nodal cells. These cells have something called a resting membrane potential. This is the potential at which the cell is at rest. It has not been stimulated. It's ready to be stimulated at any moment. But whenever we take the cell in order to be able to get it to be stimulated, to open up specific channels, which is going to be represented here in this actual pink one, this is called a voltage gated sodium channel. And really in order for me to activate that voltage gated sodium channel, I have to bring the resting membrane potential to threshold. How do I do that? Well, usually that's where nerves will stimulate something and bring it up to that point. Well, this channel is kind of always open, this inward sodium channel, uh, funny sodium channel. And what it does is it'll bring the resting membrane potential close and closer and closer to the threshold potential. So who is responsible for this one? This right here is the job of the funny, I'm going to put like the little channel there. This is the job of the funny sodium channel that'll bring the cell closer towards the actual threshold potential. So what is this potential at negative 40? This is the threshold potential. The funny sodium channel will help with that. So it'll allow for a little bit of sodium to trickle in. On top of that, once this funny sodium channel is open, these positive ions here, they can activate another channel nearby. And this channel is called T-type calcium channels. These are called T-type, T-type calcium channels. Now when these open, they allow for a little bit of calcium to be able to trickle in to the cell. So now it's going to allow for a little bit more positive ions to trickle into the cell and make the cell again more increasingly positive. So now if we make the cell more increasingly positive with the funny sodium channels and then on top of that, we make it even more positive with the T-type calcium channels, that should bring it to threshold potential. So who is really allowing for this process to occur for me to bring the resting membrane potential to threshold potential slowly? It's the job of two particular channels. One is the job of the funny sodium channel, and then later it's the job of the T-type calcium channels. Now, once it brings it to threshold potential, now we're at an actual potential, negative 40 millivolts, where the voltage-gated sodium channels, which are currently closed at rest, open. Once they open, these are called your L-type calcium channels. These are called your L-type calcium channels. They really allow for a ton of calcium to flood into this actual pacemaker cells and make the cell extremely positive to the point where now this thing is going to shoot upwards and usually above one of the peak potentials, which is zero millivolts, it'll pop up all the way up here. So who is responsible for this? This upward phase here is due to the L-type calcium channels being opened and calcium flooding into the cell, making the cell super, super positive. Now the cell is depolarized. And once it's depolarized, it can then have another way of being able to spread these action potentials, this positive charge onto another cell. Do you know how it does that? It's really cool. There's another cell maybe right next door to this one. And the way that it may communicate with a nearby atrial cell, so let's say that the SE node, it's the one that generates the action potentials. It'll send the action potentials and it'll send it to other atrial cells via what? These little things here called gap junctions. And then some of these positive ions will leak over into the nearby cell and generate an action potential in that next cell. So that's really, really a cool concept here. But nonetheless, let's keep going through the channel processes here.
Once we get to the positive charge here, we get above zero millivolts, what happens is the voltage gated calcium channels close. So once you get them to the peak point of uh, the actual depolarization, they start to close. As they start to close, what happens is now no calcium will be flooding in. Usually the funny sodium channels and the uh, T-type calcium channels, they should be closed at the point whenever they hit threshold potential. So once the, thresh once the threshold potential is hit, these generally close and the voltage gated calcium channels open. Calcium rushes in. Once it gets really, really positive above zero millivolts, the calcium channels will close. Once they close, another channel will start to open. And this channel nearby here is actually really kind of cool and this is called a voltage gated potassium channel. So what is this channel here called on the side here? This is called a voltage gated potassium channel. This will open once the actual cell is super, super positive. It'll activate this channel. And this channel, which was once closed, is now going to open. And it's going to allow for a ton of potassium ions to leave the cell. If positive ions are leaving the cell, what's going to happen to the charge inside of the cell? If you're losing positive ions, you're going to now make the cell super, super negative. And what that's going to do is that's going to cause this actual voltage to start moving downwards until you hit to resting membrane potential. So who's going to be responsible for the downward phase of the actual potential? This is due to the voltage-gated potassium channels. So the voltage-gated potassium channels are going to be the ones responsible for this downward phase. Okay, and then what happens is you'll get to the resting membrane potential and it'll be maintained for a while. And the way that we maintain the resting membrane potential is through these other pumps called sodium, potassium, ATPases. And all these are going to do is they're going to pump sodium out of the cell and they're going to pump potassium into the cell because they're trying to regenerate the concentration gradients. So you've been pushing potassium out of the cell. You've got to replenish it and push it back into the cell. And then on top of that, you were pushing sodium into the cell. You got to push it back outwards so you have it available. You want to regenerate those concentration gradients. But whenever you do this, you actually have more positive ions that are actually going to be, again, leaving the cell than positive ions are coming into the cell. And that kind of just allows for this cell to be in a resting state. So resting membrane potential may be maintained for a little bit via these sodium potassium pumps. But then once it's at rest for a while, guess what happens? The funny sodium channels open. Once they do that, they cause the T-type calcium channels to open. Once the T-type calcium channels open, they cause the cell to go to threshold potential. Voltage-gated calcium channels open. They go upwards above zero millivolts. They close. Voltage-gated potassium channels then start to open, and eventually they go to resting membrane potential, which is maintained via the sodium-potassium ATPases. That is how this all works within the SA nodal and AV nodal cells, my friends. This is how that process generally occurs. So that is what I really want you to understand. But there's actually one other thing that we have to add on here. We utilize terminology of phases, which are going to come up a lot whenever we talk about the mechanism of action of these drugs, which is really important. There's phases to this upwards of this pacemaker potential due to the funny sodium channels and the T-type calcium channels. And this phase is called phase four. Okay, it's called phase four. So it's whenever you're going from resting membrane potential up to threshold potential. Then whenever the, usually at the end of phase four, going into this next phase where we really have the rising phase where the L-type calcium channels open, this is called phase zero. Then afterwards, we go into this next one, which is a little odd. <laughs> You'll understand later when we get into the non-pacemaker cells. But once the voltage-gated calcium channels close and the voltage-gated potassium channels open, and you have this downward phase going towards resting membrane potential, this is called phase three. So again, recap, phase four is the resting to threshold due to the funny sodium channels and T-type calcium. At the end of phase four, going upwards, phase zero is the voltage-gated calcium channels or the L-type calcium channels. And then going downwards, the downward phase of the action potential is due to voltage-gated potassium channels. This is phase three. Very, very important to remember that this is the way the action potentials occur and are conducted within the pacemaker cells, most primarily the SA node and the AV node. Okay, that's super important. What we now need to talk about, and then one more thing here is that 
the way that this types of action potentials are, are generated are not as fast. They're kind of a slow kind of action potential type of tissue. So that's a really important to remember is that this is kind of what's called a slow action potential tissue. Now let's talk about the other scenario. Okay. Now we have the other parts of the cardiac tissue that is not a part of this black system here. The SC node, the AV node, the bundle of HIST, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. We're talking about any other atrial or ventricular tissue that's not a part of that nodal system. Most significantly, the SC node and the AV node. So now I'm talking about maybe this tissue here in the ventricle or this tissue here in the atria that is not a part of the nodal system. So all we need to write down here is that this is any type of atrial or ventricular myocyte that does not have any intrinsic automaticity. In other words, it doesn't have the ability to generate these, what's called pacemaker potentials. This phase four, that's only the capability that can be gained in pacemaker cells. So they don't have that intrinsic automaticity to generate their own actual potentials and cause them to produce them and then generate and pass it on to other cells. These cells don't have that, so they're non-pacemaker producing cells. So how do these ones actually allow for the conduction of action potential and then generate action potentials? Well, the way they do it is, imagine here is a pacemaker cell. So here's like a nodal cell of some type, right? Or maybe it's another, you know, myocyte, atrial or ventricular myocyte, but it received action potentials from this pacemaker cell. What did I tell you is here that is allowing for communication between these cells? Gap junctions. And gap junctions can allow for some degree of positive ions to enter into the cell. And once they allow for these positive ions to enter into the cell from a nearby pacemaker or nearby ventricular atrial myocyte, once they get in, they can actually kind of cause this action potential process to occur, which is really interesting. So how does it actually occur? Well, again, going back here, here's going to be a graphical representation of the atrial or ventricular myocytes and how they generate action potentials or allow for the conduction of action potentials. Well, here on this graph here, we're gonna have negative 90 millivolts. In this atrial and ventricular myocytes, this is referred to as their resting membrane potential. Now, these actual atrial and ventricular myocytes can have threshold potentials, but they're kind of variable and they're not super significant in the discussion of this actual lecture. What's really important is what happens in this process here is that let's say here we have an atrial ventricular myocyte. Some positive ions leak into it. It's in resting state, right? It's in a resting state. What happens is these gap junctions, so this is your gap junctions, allow for ions to pass from this cell to this cell. It makes this cell just a teensy bit positive. Enough positivity that what it can do is it can activate these channels here. What are these channels here in blue? These channels are called voltage-gated sodium channels. What are these ones here called? These ones here in blue are called your voltage-gated sodium channels. Super important here, guys. I really want you guys to pay attention at this point here. Because what happens is once these are open, they're going to allow for sodium to flush into the cell extremely quickly. This flies in like a son of a gun, and it makes the cell extremely positive very, very quickly. So it can go from zero to 100 real quick, all right? So what happens is, is that negative 90 millivolts, gap junctions allow for a little bit of ions to trickle in to activate these voltage-gated sodium channels. When they open up, it'll go and have this acute rise. So it's gonna go here from here, whoosh, and it's gonna fly straight up, okay? So it's gonna fly straight up, and this is usually gonna fly above kind of zero millivolts, which is part of the peak potentials generally, and this is actually going to come up really, really high due to what? What channel is responsible for this? It's that blue channel there. This is due to the voltage-gated sodium channels. All right, so voltage-gated sodium channels open, and they allow for this cell to go from resting membrane potential, whoosh, all the way up and generate this, positive phase or rising phase of the action potential. Once it does that and the cell becomes super positive, what happens is we'll talk about this a little bit later, but sodium channels have different types of gates, if you will. They have what's called a activation gate and inactivation gate. When they're at the resting state, what happens is their um, inactivation gate in this situation is actually going to be what? It's gonna be open and then their activation gate is closed. Once you kind of get them out of that resting state and stimulate them, their activation gate opens and sodium floods in. Then once you hit this positive point of the action potential, their inactivation gate 
closes, okay? And so now sodium can't come into the cell anymore. Now, once that happens and it starts kind of like closing off, what it does is it activates two channels. So once this cell gets to this very, very positive type of charge inside of the cell, it's gonna activate two particular channels. It's gonna activate this channel, and it's also going to activate this channel here. It's gonna activate these two particular channels. This pink channel here is called your L-type calcium channels. And once they're activated, they're gonna allow for calcium to rush into the cell. And then this is gonna be a voltage-gated sodium, I'm sorry, potassium channel, potassium channel. And they're going to allow for potassium to leak out of the cell. And positive ions are going to leak out of the cell. What happens first is, what happens first, is once we get upwards, so once sodium rushes in and it makes the cell super positive, it activates the voltage-gated potassium channels just a little bit earlier than the voltage-gated, I'm sorry, the L-type calcium channels. So then what happens is you get this kind of like small dip, if you will. You see the small little dip. And that small little dip right there where the cell becomes a little bit more negative. Why? Because positive ions are leaving the cell. If positive ions are leaving the cell, then you're going to have the cell become slightly negative. And what that does is that causes this little dip here on this actual kind of like phase of the actual potential. This little dip where the cell becomes just slightly negative is due to voltage-gated potassium channels just opening up just a little bit earlier than the L-type calcium channels. Then the L-type calcium channels finally are super open and they start flooding in at the same time the potassium is still leaving the cell. So we have positive ions coming into the cell and positive ions leaving the cell. So if I have positive ions leaving the cell, it's making the cell negative but I have positive ions coming into the cell, that's making the cell positive, they cancel each other out. And when they cancel each other out, you kind of get this plateau phase, if you will, where it kind of stays at the same voltage. And then eventually what happens is, the voltage-gated calcium channels eventually shut down. They actually close. But during this phase right here, where it's this plateau phase, where it kind of stays the same, what is this? This is actually due to two particular channels. This is due to the L-type calcium channels being open in addition to the voltage-gated potassium channels being open. So you have two channels that are open during this particular plateau phase. Now, eventually what happens is, as you end this plateau phase, as calcium is coming in and potassium is going out, eventually gets to the point where what happens is, just really quickly, once positive ions like calcium comes into the cell, what it does is it activates this channels here on what's called your sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum. And it stimulates these. These calcium ions will stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum and cause it to release calcium ions out of it to trigger kind of a muscle contraction process. Once that happens during the plateau phase and you already have the calcium being released, then we don't need this calcium to continuously keep coming in. So we shut that calcium channel off. Once we shut the calcium channel off, what we want to do is we're done with contraction. The calcium's already started the contraction process. We want the cell to start beginning to relax. So what happens is, what we do is we actually start pumping calcium out of the cell and back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So all the calcium that was actually present in the cell during this plateau phase, we're going to pump it back in here, or we're going to take the calcium and we're gonna pump it out of the cell. We're gonna to try to get the calcium out of the cell. And then we're gonna keep these voltage-gated potassium channels continuously open. Super, super important, I can't stress this enough. Once we get to the end of the plateau phase, the calcium stimulated the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, trigger the contraction process. After the contraction process is done, we want the cell to rest. So we want to shut these voltage-gated calcium channels off. We want to push the calcium that was present in the cytoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or push the calcium ions out of the cell. We don't want the calcium in here anymore, causing contraction. So what we do is we push the calcium ions out or we push the calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But we keep this puppy open. And then what happens, if it stays open, the potassium ions are gonna keep leaving and leaving and leaving and causing the cell to become increasingly more negative to the point where now look what's gonna happen. We're gonna cause the cell to become negative, 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 and it's gonna go back 
to the resting membrane potential. And we're gonna maintain the resting membrane potential via what type of channels here? The sodium potassium ATPases. We're gonna pump the potassium back into the cell to regenerate the gradient and pump the sodium out of the cell to regenerate the gradient. But since we pump more positive ions out of the cell and less positive ions into the cell, we make the cell more slightly negative. And that maintains the resting membrane potential, okay? But who is going to be responsible for this downward phase here? That's just gonna be the voltage-gated potassium channel. Okay, so to recap this, cells at rest, gap junctions allow for ions to, from a pacemaker cell or a nearby atrial ventricular myocyte to pass those positive ions into him. When he gets these positive ions, activates the upward phase where the voltage-gated sodium channels open and sodium rushes in, making the cell super positive. This right here, my friends, is called phase zero, okay? Sodium rushes in. Then once sodium rushes in, it makes the inside of the cell super positive and it shuts off the voltage-gated sodium channels. They're, they're closed now. They're not going to allow for sodium to enter in anymore once we're at this peak point. Then what it does is when it's at this peak point, it opens up two channels, the voltage-gated potassium channels and the voltage-gated or L-type uh, calcium channels. When they open up, potassium is going to open up a little bit quicker and start exiting out of the cell. When it exits out of the cell, it makes the actual charge inside of the cell drop down, become more negative. This right here, with this, this downward phase here is called phase one. So the downward phase here is phase one. Then, as the voltage to calcium channels, uh, voltage to potassium channels maintain their patency, they keep open, they keep allowing for potassium to leave. But then these L-type calcium channels finally open, enough to allow calcium to rush in. So then you have positive ions like calcium coming in and positive ions like potassium going out. But it makes this inside of the cell the same electroneutrality because you have positive ions coming in, making the cell positive, positive ions leaving, which are causing the cell to become negative. Those cancel each other out and maintain this plateau phase. This is called phase two. Then once the voltage-gated calcium channels close, because what you want to do is, you want the calcium to come in via these L-type calcium channels, stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to pump calcium out, cause the muscle cell to contract. Once it's done contracting, you want it to relax so that it can be stimulated again. So then what you do is you take the calcium, pump it into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you shut these calcium channels off, and you pump the calcium out of the cell so that you can regenerate that gradient. Because you want calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to be available again, and you want to push calcium out of the cell so that you can use it again to come back in. So by doing that, you shut the calcium channels off, pump the calcium back in here, and pump the calcium out. Now, no more calcium should be coming in, only voltage-gated potassium channels should be open at this point. And when they're open, they allow for positive ions to leak out, making the cell negative, and this is going to be phase three. Then, as you go downwards here into this flat phase, this flat phase right here, until you get ready to generate another action potential, it's called phase four. That's when you're at the resting state. The cell is in the resting state generated by the sodium potassium ATPases. Okay, now that we've talked about that, this is important to remember that this is what occurs in the non-pacemaker cells. And because of this, look how fast this kind of action potentials occur. These are kind of your fast action potential inducing tissue, all right? So now that we understand the cardiac action potentials in both the pacemaker cells, how they look like with all the channels, all the flowing of ions, and then how they look in the graph, and we can compare that to the non-pacemaker cells, the atrial and ventricular myocytes, how their channels are all working, how they're flowing, and what it looks like on the graphical representation. Now what I think we can start to begin to do is, is generate a concept of how arrhythmias are generated, and then how we can really approach to actually treat arrhythmias. Because if I can find drugs that really block the slow AP producing tissue, the nodal tissue, so the SA node, AV node primarily, I should have some drugs that can really block the AV node. And that may be useful in certain arrhythmias. In other situations, I wanna give drugs that could actually block the action potentials that are present in the fast action potential tissue. So the atrial and ventricular tissue that's not a pacemaker tissue. If I can suppress those tissues from generating arrhythmias, that might be helpful. And so what you'll see is that 
In this tissue, we're primarily gonna be focusing on drugs that can block the pacemaker cells, particularly the AV node. And how they're actually going to block the AV node, we'll talk about in detail. But if we can block the action potentials being produced or the conducting of action potentials through the AV node, we can slow the heart rate down, which is important in what type of arrhythmias? Tachyarrhythmia. So whenever the patient's heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute, that's where we're really gonna be utilizing antiarrhythmic medications is tachyarrhythmias. So I'm gonna talk about drugs that'll really help to suppress the conduction of action potentials through the AV node and SA node via the pacemaker cell blockade. And then what I'll do is I'll talk about some drugs that we can utilize to suppress the action potentials and electrical activity within the non-pacemaker cells, the atrial and ventricular myocytes that gained some ability to generate action potentials undesirably. And we'll talk about how they can actually do that a little bit later. But that's what I want you guys to understand. So now let's come down for a second. Let's talk about how do arrhythmias actually develop? We're gonna do this very basically. If you guys wanna know more about arrhythmias and the path of physiology, go watch our video on arrhythmias and they'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I'm gonna basically kinda of introduce it and then we're gonna talk about a strategy and then we'll go into each drug category, their mechanism of action, how they're actually going to treat these arrhythmias and then we'll go into a little bit more a little bit later about what's the approach to every single type of arrhythmia? How do I actually kind of like get this fit into my brain? We'll get into that. So let's now come down and talk about that. Whenever patients actually develop arrhythmias, we're not gonna go through the crazy path of this. I don't think it'll actually give us much in the understanding of antiarrhythmics. So to really go down that depth, I, I don't know if it'll give you much benefit. So what I really want you to understand is when patients actually develop arrhythmias, they can develop in three particular pathophysiology, re, like pathophysiological reasons. One is that their SA node may be firing maybe a little bit too fast and sending action potentials down really, really quickly to the AV node and then down into the ventricles. And so if that's happening, you're having a very fast type of rate that's being generated from the SA node or maybe being quickly conducted through the AV node. And in those situations, that's due to an intrinsic problem within the SA node and the AV node where they're either conducting action potentials through fat too fastly or generating action potentials too fastly. And that's usually due to what's called increased or enhanced automaticity. And you can see this really in any type of like increased sympathetic state really is what you'll, what you'll have. But we don't usually use antiarrhythmic drugs in these particular scenarios. So again, that's usually just due to an increased conduction, like an increased SA node um, or an increased activity of the AV node where they're just conducting action potentials or generating action potentials super fast. But this is what you see in like sinus tachycardia. So it's not gonna be super beneficial because we don't really give medications to treat a sinus tachycardia. You treat the underlying cause of their increased sympathetic outflow. Another mechanism is that sometimes what happens is we take an atrial cell or we take a ventricular cell that's not a part of this pacemaker system and we cause it to become agitated. We trigger it in a particular way. We load them with calcium ions and we cause or we prolong their uh, kind of like their what's oh, called their, um, their QT interval. And when we do that, what we do is we create an opportunity for these cells to become agitated and generate, they somehow generate an abnormal automaticity. So they start kind of generating action potentials and they generate action potentials faster than the SA node and AV node can. And because of that, they start generating super fast action potentials that go to the AV node or that spread throughout the ventricles. And so in these situations, we can see very dangerous arrhythmias due to what's called triggered activity. Triggered activity. And these are usually what we refer to as something called, you'll, you may have heard these terms in our arrhythmia lecture, EADs, so early after depolarizations, or what's called DADs, delayed after depolarizations. So EADs are something that you usually see with patients who are having what's called prolonged QT intervals. So that they're utilizing drugs, and we'll talk about some of these here, that actually prolong the QT interval. And so that creates an opportunity for these EADs to form. Or um, certain like electrolyte abnormalities, like low potassium, low magnesium may create opportunities for this. Whereas DADs are usually due to lots of calcium loading in the cells, which so lots of sympathetic overdrive, um, particularly like ischemia um, to the actual myocardium or hypoxia, um, digoxin toxicity, you can see a lot of these things with this. But these tissues, the atrial and ventricular tissue, not the pacemaker tissue, generate the ability to intrinsically depolarize and generate action potentials faster than the SA node and AV node.
So that's an interesting concept. And you know what actually may be good for that? There may be good particular drugs that may be helpful to either block the AV node or maybe give drugs that actually block the triggered activity at the atrial and ventricular myocytes that are generating these triggered activ activity. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. The third mechanism is that there may be something called a reentrant circuit. So sometimes this can be uh, anatomical. So you can sometimes have this like weird um, kind of like anatomical structure here called like the bundle of Kent. And it allows for this kind of reentrant kind of cycle to occur where electrical activity may flow down the AV node through the ventricles and then back up through this accessory pathway and it can go really, really fast. And so sometimes you can see that with these very anatomical things called uh, like the bundle of kit and WPW. You can also see that sometimes you can develop reentrant circuits like in particular nodal tissue. So sometimes you can generate these reentrant cycles within the AV node, or you can generate reentrant cycles within the atria. Or you can generate reentrant cycles within the ventricles. We're not going to go through all the mechanisms here, but you can have atrial tissue, ventricular tissue, AV nodal tissue, or these large kind of like anatomical accessory pathways that allow for these reentrant circuits. And the problem with these reentrant circuits is they generate really, really fast action potentials. And so that's another particular mechanism that I want you guys to be aware of, which are called reentrant circuits. And we can see these as anatomical, so they can be kind of like anatomical types of uh, abnormalities. And we see this a lot with what's called WPW. Or sometimes they can be functional. And you see these functional abnormalities, you see this in things like AVNRT, uh, which is a type of SVT. You can see this in things like VTAC. You can see this in things like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, a lot of like weird kind of reentrant circuits that can develop due to fibrosis or scarring or uh, particular types of structural abnormalities within the myocardial tissue. But either way, the whole concept here is that when you look at this, the problem is becoming of what? With, with arrhythmias, that you're not following the normal cardiac conduction pathway. If you are, it's usually increased automaticity, right? So this SC node is just super hyperactive or the AV node is conducting potentials super fast. That's not the arrhythmias that we're gonna utilize antiarrhythmics for. It's really these. It's when you have an atrial tissue or ventricular tissue that's not a pacemaker tissue generating action potentials because you trigger it. Or atrial tissue, ventricular, uh, sorry, atrial tissue or ventricular tissue is generating reentrant circuits and generating these super fast rates and abnormal rhythms that are gonna be causing very abnormal types of tachyarrhythmias. And so really what I want us to really talk about here is how do we actually kind of utilize these medications? Because this is the way that I like to remember them. I really think helps you when you think about arrhythmias is, and what we're talking about for utilizing uh, antiarrhythmics is that when patients develop a tachycardia, they're beating at very fast rates, so greater than 100 beats per minute. And the reasons why they can develop that is because of increased automaticity, increased conduction. This is the one that we don't really care about though. It's these two that we care about. They can develop very fast heart rates due to triggered activity or reentrant circuits. I think one of the best ways to understand how these antiarrhythmics can be utilized approach wise is to look at it in two particular fashions. One is let's say that we have this tissue here, let's actually use the colors that we've been using, whether it be due to the atrial tissue, whether it be due to the atrial tissue generating these triggered activities, so you have an ectopic fo foci here that's triggering and firing super fast, or whether it be due to a reentrant circuit here that's developing within the atria and it's generating these very fast action potentials. In atrial types of arrhythmias, or supraventricular tachyarrhythmias, what are the different types of uh, supraventricular tachyarrhythmias? Do you guys know? Here, let's say, we got a couple of them. The primary ones that you wanna know. One is atrial fibrillation, right? One is called atrial flutter. The other one is called SVT. These are the primary types of atrial or supraventricular tachyarrhythmias. What happens with these is, whether you have a reentrant circuit or a triggered activity, all of this electrical activity is going to one particular point, the electrical gateway or window between the atria and the ventricles. So the electrical activity from this reentrant circuit will go here to the AV node. This ectopic focus in the atria is gonna be going towards the AV node. 
So all the electrical activity from this kind of like tissue here, or tissue here, they're generating super fast rates. It has to go to the AV node, who will then conduct the action potentials into the ventricles. That's the issue, right? And if I get these rates to go fast down to the ventricles, then the ventricles are going to be beating at super fast rates. So what if I could come up with drugs that specifically inhibit or suppress the conduction of action potentials from these fast tissues here? I suppress the AV node and I block it. And if I block it, I block all these fast action potentials that are occurring in the atria from going out into the ventricles. Because you know why that's dangerous? If the atria is beating at, let's say, 300 beats per minute, that's pretty fast, right? But the atria isn't the one that's responsible for squeezing blood out of the heart. It's the ventricles. So if my ventricles are beating at 300 beats per minute, there's like literally no chance it's going to be able to fill or really generate adequate contractility. And that is not compatible with life. So what we don't want is a patient's action potentials that are coming from the atria, maybe at 100 or 200 beats per minute, to be generated into the ventricles at that fast of a rate. So what we want to do is we want to give drugs that can rate control and block the AV node. So this is where drugs, what we utilize here in this particular scenario, what we're going to do with them is we're going to rate control. And we're gonna do that by suppressing or blocking the electrical activity from the atria into the ventricle at the AV node. What drugs that we're gonna talk about later are going to be good at suppressing and blocking the AV node? And we'll talk about how they actually do it a little bit later. But this is the ones that I want you to remember. First ones are going to be what's called your beta blockers. So your beta blockers are very good at blocking the AV node and suppressing a lot of the electrical activity from the atrial tissue going through the AV node and into the ventricles. We also give another name for this. There's what's called like this Vincent kind of classification system. We use like class or types. So this is a class or type two antiarrhythmic drug. And we'll talk about these a little bit later. The next one we can do to suppress the actual AV node is we can give drugs called calcium channel blockers. So calcium channel blockers are also decently uh, utilized drugs in these particular kind of diseases here. And these are what's called a class or type four antiarrhythmic drug. Okay. The next ones that we can use here are technically not a part of that like Vince uh, kind, of, kind of classification system, the typical classification system. We put them in miscellaneous, which is like a class five drug. And there's two types here. One is called adenosine. So adenosine is another particular drug that we can utilize here. And this is kind of like a miscellaneous, but we sometimes we just put this in what's called the type five or class five antiarrhythmic drug class. So here we'll put these in like the, the type or class five antiarrhythmic drug category. And there's one more, and this one is called digoxin. This one is called digoxin. Again, it's a part of that miscellaneous or class five antiarrhythmic drug category. But what I want you to remember is all of these drugs are working in some way, shape, or form to suppress the AV node, which is going to work on this type of tissue, the slow action potential producing tissue. It's going to alter the channels in this particular tissue. That's why I focused on that so much. So we're going to utilize these drugs to suppress particular channels or act like action potential processes in the AV nodal cell primarily. That's why I focused on the pacemaker cell act activity there. In the other situation, that's going to be for these types of arrhythmias, things like AFib, A-flutter, SVT. And with SVT, there's two types. There's AVNRT as well as what's called um, AVRT. So AVNRT is like the nodal reentrant tachycardia. And then AVRT is like your Wolf Parkinson's white syndrome. But we can utilize it in these particular scenarios, okay? The non-pacemaker blockade is a little bit different. So now what we're trying to do is we're saying, okay, here's that tissue here. Here's the atrial tissue, and it's generating these ectopic foci. It's becoming a triggered activity there. Or we have a reentrant circuit here. Maybe we have a reentrant circuit generating within the atria. Okay, or same kind of concept here. We have a reentrant tissue here within the ventricle, kind of reentrant circuit that's developing within the ventricle, or an ectopic focus that's de 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 developing within the ventricle. So now we already talked about ways that we can block the atrial signals from getting down into the AV node and then into the ventricles. We've already talked about that. That's going to be these drugs that block the AV node. What if there was a way? that I could shut down the reentrant circuit, 
or shut down the triggered activity in both the atrial cells and the ventricular cells. What if I could do that? What if I could somehow, a patient who has supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, so let's say for the atrial ones, we're talking about patients who have atrial fibrillation, we're talking about atrial flutter, we're talking about maybe even SVT, but this is gonna be a plus or minus. And we talk about the ventricular arrhythmia, so we're talking about things like VTAC, we're talking about things like torsades de points. In these particular situations, what if I could suppress or reduce the action potentials that are being generated by the atrial and ventricular myocytes that are non-pacemaker tissues that are responsible for causing these arrhythmias? What if I could stop them from producing these types of arrhythmias? Wouldn't that be beneficial? I'm not gonna block the AV node. I'm just going to suppress them and try to get them back into a normal sinus rhythm. So we call this type of process here where we're trying to take and switch these over and suppress them, we call this kind of a rhythm control. We call this more of a rhythm control or a cardioversion type of process. Now what drugs are gonna be good at actually suppressing the action potentials and particularly these atrial and ventricular myocytes? That's the good question, right? The tissues that, the drugs that are really good in this particular activity is gonna be drugs that block the sodium channels, the voltage-gated sodium channels, and drugs that block the voltage-gated potassium channels. So we call these drugs your sodium channel blockers, okay? And these are sometimes referred to, or commonly referred to, that, that classic um, system there, class one uh, antiarrhythmic drugs, okay? The other one is the potassium channel blockers. So the potassium channel blockers, so we have sodium channel blockers and then we have what's called potassium channel blockers. And this is going to be what's called the class three antiarrhythmic drugs, okay? So these are really, really, really important that I need you to understand that. The class two, class four, and some of the miscellaneous class five, they suppress the atrial arrhythmias by blocking the AV node to rate control these patients, prevent their atrial rate from causing very fast ventricular rates. They don't convert them back into a normal rhythm. In patients who have atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, where we're not going to suppress the AV node, but we wanna to try to take and convert these kind of abnormal triggered atrial cells or reentrant atrial cells or triggered ventricular cells or reentrant ventricular cells, we want to suppress them, shut them down, and allow for the normal sinus rhythm to go back into a place here. That's called rhythm control or a cardioversion kind of technique. In those situations, we use sodium channel blockers, potassium channel blockers, class one, class three, and in some ways we can even potentially use a plus or minus here for the third situation, you also may be able to use beta blockers. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but beta blockers, which are your class two antiarrhythmic drugs, they're really good at suppressing the sympathetic nervous system. Because if you suppress the sympathetic nervous system, you can actually potentially inhibit the triggered activity and you may be able to be able to suppress some of the uh, re-entrant cycles. Because sometimes the sympathetic nervous system can just really exacerbate triggered activity especially and re-entrant circuits. And so if you give a beta blocker, you may be able to suppress the sympathetic drive on these types of cells. But again, these are gonna be the two primary ones for uh, rhythm control or conversion, and this is gonna be primarily the ones for rate control. So I want you guys to understand that. So now that we've done that, we've built a very strong foundation knowing that these drugs are gonna work potentially on the atrial and ventricular myocytes. They're gonna be altering those channels. So the sodium channels, the potassium channels that are involved in the fast action potential producing tissue. Now that I know that and I understand this mechanism, let's now go into the drugs that are actually going to cause blockade of the AV node and how they're actually going to, to help they specifically suppress the AV node, reduce the action potentials, how they alter the graph here. And then what we'll do is we'll then go later, after we go through all of these drugs, we'll then go into how do the sodium channel blockers and potassium channel blockers really work to alter the electrical activity inside of these atrial and ventricular cells, but how do they specifically do that in the sodium channels, the potassium channels, and how does that alter the graphical representation here? So let's do that now, we got a lot to talk about. Let's get into it. All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about beta blockers first, okay? So this is gonna be kind of our type or class two antiarrhythmic drug. Now, 
When we talk about beta blockers, let's talk about some of the beta blockers, the actual names of those drugs. So a lot of them you can just remember the OLALs, right? So there's the metoprolol, which is a very commonly utilized one. Um, you can also remember like a tenolol, propanolol, anything really with a law. So there's a lot of these drugs out there, okay? Now what I really want you to understand with these drugs is how exactly do they block the AV node, which will suppress the actual super fast rates from going from the atrium to the ventricle in diseases such as AFib, A-flutter, SVT, things to that effect. How are they really working here? And then we talk about them a little bit later that they also can be used to suppress the sympathetic effect in situations like VTAC. They can actually be very helpful in VTAC. But nonetheless, we have a patient here who has some disease, okay? What, whether that disease is, again, very commonly utilized here in situations such as atrial fibrillation, it can be utilized in atrial flutter, and it can even be utilized in things called SVT as a prophylaxis. But what happens with these diseases is that you have this irritated area of an atrial focus, which is sending super fast action potentials, way faster than the SA node, that's getting to the AV node. And if we have these action potentials go through the AV node super quick, they can cause very fast ventricular rates. So then we can end up with what's called AFib with a rapid ventricular rate, or A-flutter with a rapid ventricular rate, or SVT that can sometimes go super, super fast. But how can we suppress, basically block the action potentials from going through the AV node and suppress this actual super fast rate? Well, let's say that I take this AV nodal cell right here. I'm gonna zoom in on one of the cells in the AV node and look at how beta blockers actually do this. So on these uh, AV nodal cells here, we're gonna have something called a beta receptor. So what is this receptor here? This is called a beta one receptor. Now what happens is epinephrine, norepinephrine, usually what they do is they bind onto, so let's say that here we have something called epinephrine and norepinephrine. When they bind onto this actual receptor here, what they do is they activate a protein called a G-stimulatory protein. The G-stimulatory protein will then activate an enzyme here called adenylate cyclase. And what adenylate cyclase will do is it'll take a molecule called ATP and convert it into cyclic AMP, and that'll activate something called protein kinase A, and protein kinase A will go and phosphorylate. What it'll do is it'll put phosphate groups on these channels. Don't these look familiar? on the pacemaker cells. So if you look at the pacemaker cells, remember the pacemaker cells had the funny sodium channels, they had the T-type calcium channels, so they had the L-type calcium channels. These are L-type calcium channels. What are these channels called? L-type calcium channels. What I'm going to do is, is when epinephrine and norepinephrine bind on here, so here's epinephrine, norepinephrine, they bind on here, they stimulate this pathway, they cause the phosphorylation of these channels and cause calcium to flood in. And if calcium floods into the cell, it makes the cell super positive, which increases the speed of the action potentials. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give a drug called metoprolol, atenolol, propanolol, any of these drugs. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to suppress or block the effect here of norepinephrine, epinephrine at the beta-1 receptor. What I'm gonna do is, I'm no longer going to stimulate the G-stimulatory protein. I'm going to inhibit the G-stimulatory protein. I'm going to inhibit the activation of adenylate cyclase. I'm going to decrease the conversion of ATP into cyclic AMP. I'm gonna decrease the activation of protein kinase A. I'm going to not phosphorylate the L-type calcium channels. Therefore, I won't open them as nicely. And therefore, calcium will not enter into the pacemaker cells. Go back now to the phases. Here is what phase? Phase four. This is phase zero. This is phase three. Phase four is funny sodium channels, T-type calcium channels. Phase zero is L-type calcium channels. Phase three is voltage-gated potassium channels. If I block the L-type calcium channels from opening these generally open right at the end of phase four going into phase zero. So now I'm going to block them. What is the overall effect going to be now? So now instead of me allowing for, so let's say that we started off here, right? I'm going to block right here at the end of phase four going into phase zero. So now instead of me allowing for this phase four to go here and then up, I'm going to delay it. It's gonna take a longer time for me to be able to get this phase four up here to phase zero. And then this is going to cause, look at this, less frequency of 
action potentials. So now there's going to be a decreased frequency of action potentials moving through the AV node. So what is it going to do? Beta blockers on this effect here are going to inhibit the L-type calcium channels from opening and that is going to decrease the slope of phase four. And even if you think about it here, because it also will block the calcium channels from entering, you may even get a little bit of a decrease in the slope of phase four, but also in phase zero. So you, your phase zero may also be a little bit slower as well. So if you look here, you may also have a slower phase zero. Okay, so phase four and phase zero in what? In the AV node. So what that's going to do is, you're going to decrease the conduction of action potential throughout this AV node, which is going to help to rate control. It'll help with the rate control of AFib, A-flutter, and SVT. So that's what I want you to understand about these drugs. Now, when we talk about these drugs, they have many different types of adverse drug reactions. We'll talk about them a little bit more later, but obviously with any type of beta blocker, you suppress the AV node. If you do suppress the AV node, what are some of the things that you have to watch out for, my friends? Watch out for bradycardia. Also, it can actually block the beta receptors on the contractile portion of the myocardium, which can cause decreased contractility, so it may cause hypotension, especially in decompensated heart failure. It also can cause um, activation or inhibition of the beta-2 receptors on the bronchioles, which will cause bronchoconstriction. And it may even cause hypoglycemia and awareness. We'll talk about that later, but things to watch out for with this drug. So now we know the mechanism of action, we know the diseases that it's actually used to treat and how it treats those diseases, and we know what it would look like specifically on the actual graphical representation. So if they were to ask you, what does this one look like? Well, it slows phase four, a little bit of phase zero, should not affect phase three. Slows or delays the, the slope of phase four and zero should not affect phase three. But the primary one that you're gonna see most likely in the test here is phase four. It has a little bit of effect on phase zero. So does the next one that we're gonna talk about called calcium channel blockers. Let's talk about those. All right, so now calcium channel blockers. These are your class four, type four antiarrhythmic drugs. So there's a couple of these. So ones that I want you to remember primarily is verapamil. So verapamil is gonna be one. And then the other one is called diltiazem. So diltiazem might be the more commonly one, uh, utilized one that you may see in, in clinical practice. But with these drugs, Okay, what are they potentially being utilized for? Again, they're blocking and suppressing the AV node. So remember I told you that they're utilized in particular like, you know, triggered activity or re-entrant circuits of some type that are causing very fast rates from the atria to try to move down through the AV node into the ventricles. So situations such as AFib, A flutter, right? And SVT prophylaxis. We're utilizing these drugs. How are we actually going to do that? Well, let's take this AV nodal cell and kind of blow it up and take a look at how it's actually going to be blocked. Well, here on this AV nodal cell, you notice something very interesting, these pink channels here. What are these pink channels here called? These channels are called your L-type calcium channels. So we block the L-type calcium channels with beta blockers, right? Uh, because they help to be able to decrease the phosphorylation of these channels, especially at the end of phase four. That's one of the most interesting things is that you block them at the end of phase four, which really delays and decreases the slope of phase four. But they may also have less calcium entry during phase zero, so it also should kind of decrease the slope there. With this one, it's the same concept. You're blocking the actual L-type calcium channels. If calcium is supposed to rush in, during the beginning of phase four and during phase zero, you're supposed to have these positive ions coming into the cell and cause this rising phase of the action potential. So generally, if you go back to the phases here, you should have phase four. At the end of phase four, L-type calcium channel should open. During phase zero, L-type calcium channel should be open and flooding through. And then during phase three, there should be potassium exiting, causing repolarization. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give these drugs and they're going to block calcium entry. And so what I'm gonna effectively see here is I'm gonna see a, de a decrease in the slope of phase four and a decrease in the slope of phase zero. And because of that, I should effectively see less conduction of action potentials through the AV node. If I see less conducting of action potentials through the AV node, that means all of these atrial signals that are trying to go through the AV node into the ventricles, I'm going to suppress them and lead to rate control. So 
what is the overall effect that I will see is I will block the calcium entry, I'll block the positive ions entering into the cell, and I'll decrease the slope. If I block these, I'll decrease the slope of phase four and phase zero in the AV node. And this is gonna be both of them. You're gonna really, really strongly, more than beta blockers, block the phase four and phase zero. So that's one of the cool things about these calcium channel blockers, but the same kind of effect is seen here, is that you are really suppressing and blocking the AV node, blocking the entry, it's the gateway between the atria to the ventricle. So all these increased atrial signals that are trying to get to the AV node and then down to the ventricles, you're blocking it right there to suppress all those electrical activity from getting down into the ventricles. Really, really cool concept. So, with calcium channel blockers, adverse drug reactions to watch out for, same with beta blockers. They block the AV node, so watch out for any bradycardia AV blocks. They also really suppress the actual um, calcium channels and the contractile myocardial cells. And that can actually really cause hypotension and worsening uh, decompensated heart failure. So be careful for that. And it also may cause some constipation. But that's the effect of the calcium channel blockers and how they actually do this. Now, we understand these. Let's talk about the next two drugs that are utilized as AV node blockers, adenosine and digoxin. All right, my friends, so now let's move on to adenosine and digoxin. This is kind of that later, kind of like miscellaneous class five antiarrhythmic drugs. So with these, we did say that they're all kind of utilized to suppress or the AV node and AFib, A-flood, or SVT. That's true. Um, however, adenosine is very short-acting, so it's not a great drug for more of kind of rate-controlling patients with AFib and A-flutter. It's more of a drug that will really shut down SVT acutely. So when a patient goes into a really rapid supraventricular tachycardia, the rates are 170s, 200s, what we can do is we can give a drug that's very short acting, very powerful, and it'll really suppress the AV node. And that's, uh, that's gonna be adenosine. So with that being said, and patients who have what's called SVT, this is more of an indication particularly for adenosine. And we'll talk about all these like arrhythmias a little bit later, but adenosine is not very good in AFib and A-flutter because it's not a longer acting drug. So it's a very short acting. So it's not good in patients who are gonna have AFib and A-flutter. So remember that. It's gonna be not very helpful for AFib and not very helpful for atrial flutter. With that being said, we also have the joxin. Digoxin is actually going to be utilized primarily for atrial fibrillation. We don't really utilize this very much for a flutter. It's not really utilized very much for SVT as well. Primarily atrial fibrillation, and that's going to be digoxin. And what we'll talk about later is it's not gonna be your first line choice. It's really only gonna be a drug that we give to patients if they have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. So if a patient has a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and atrial fibrillation, digoxin seems to be a drug that may be potentially beneficial. But again, not super helpful for patients who are gonna be utilizing it for atrial flutter, and it's not really a drug that we get for SVT. Okay, so just when I talked about that in the beginning with the AV node blockade, that is their mechanism of action. It's just when we talk about their utilization of particular diseases, it may be a little bit different that beta blockers, calcium channel blockers can treat all three of those atriarrhythmias. Adenosine, it could theoretically do that, but it's more specifically very short acting. So it's really only given in SVT. And digoxin, it could treat atrial flutter, it could treat SVT, but it's only been show, shown to be really beneficial and somewhat beneficial in atrial fibrillation in patients who have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Not super helpful in a flutter or in SVT. Okay, with that being said, how exactly do these drugs block the AV node? Because it's the same mechanism regardless. They're all gonna have these triggered activity or you're gonna have this re-entrant circuit that's sending action potentials quickly to the AV node and you wanna block that AV node and prevent the fast atrial circuit electrical activity from going down to the ventricular circuit. So you're trying to rate control these patients. It's the same concept, it's all rate control. How do we block the AV nodes? Let's take a piece of this AV nodal cells and zoom in on it here. Okay, here we're gonna have a receptor. And this receptor is for adenosine. And what happens is, when adenosine binds onto, so this is going to be adenosine. When you give adenosine, it binds onto adenosine receptor here. When it binds onto the adenosine receptor, it's actually coupled with a G inhibitory protein. So it binds on and activates a G inhibitory protein. The G inhibitory protein will then work to inhibit 
Um, because you know when G inhibitory proteins, they specifically inhibit adenylate cyclase, so you don't take ATP and convert it into cyclic AMP. So that's one thing. It will inhibit your, you know, activation of adenylate cyclase. And so yes, you will have less ATP converted into less cyclic AMP, and that will lead to less protein kinase A. And so yes, to a mild degree, you'll have less phosphorylation of the L-type calcium channels. But that's not the primary mechanism by which adenosine works. The primary mechanism is yes, you may to some mild degree, this is, I'm gonna put here, a very mild degree, block the calcium channels, right? And have less calcium enter into the cell, right? So you, that may be a possibility, but it's very, very mild effect. The more powerful effect from adenosine is that when you stimulate G inhibitory, there's two different types of, oh, well, there's three subunits. There's an alpha, beta, and gamma subunit. The alpha and beta subunit really what inhibits the adenylate cyclase. The gamma subunit is the one that actually goes and acts on another channel. So there's really, when we talk about this G inhibitory unit, what it does is it actually activates what's called alpha and beta subunit. And that really goes and inhibits the adenylate cyclase. But it also, so it'll stimulate this pathway here, but it'll also stimulate another pathway called the gamma subunit. And the gamma subunit, and this is all the inhibitory component of the G inhibitory protein. So the G inhibitory protein is actually made up of a gamma, alpha, and beta subunit. Alpha, beta will go and work on to inhibit the adenylate cyclase. The gamma one will go and act on these potassium channels and open up these potassium channels. When they stimulate or open up these potassium channels, potassium will very powerfully leak out of the cell. And when potassium exits the cell, the cell becomes super electronegative. When it becomes electronegative, it makes the inside of the cell very negative to the point where if you had this cell that's at rest, if this cell was at rest, this AV nodal cell was at rest, and you bring the inside of the cell even more negative than resting membrane potential, it's called hyperpolarization. So what does it do? It causes hyperpolarization. The cool concept about this, so we're gonna put calcium right over here to make room. The cool concept about this is if you think about this, this is our resting membrane potential. This is where the cell is at rest, right? Here's the threshold potential. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna make the inside of the cell even more negative than resting membrane potential. So now let's actually represent this in this uh, kind of like maroonish color here. This is the new point here. I'm making the cell even more negative. I'm bringing it below the resting membrane potential. So I'm gonna call this the hyperpolarized state. Hyperpolarized state. So I'm making the cell even more negative than the resting membrane potential. The problem with that is, is if I cause this hyperpolarization, now this cell will have to go from this state, the hyperpolarized state, all the way up here. Maybe it won't change the slope, so the slope may still kind of be the same. But now it's gotta take a longer time for it to be able to get to the threshold potential because it has to go from maybe negative 90, maybe negative 95, all the way up to negative 40. So because of that, I'm really hyperpolarizing this thing. So you see what I'm doing here is I'm taking and moving the cell to become more negative. I'm just gonna put a random number here, negative 95 millivolts. So now instead of going from negative 70 to negative 40, I'm going from negative 95 to negative 40. So this is called hyperpolarization. I'm gonna cause the cell to have to go from a lower like charge to bring this up to a threshold potential that's more movement. That's gonna be more difficult to be able to get the cell to that point. And that can really shut the AV node down pretty powerfully. So one of the things about adenosine here that I want you to remember is adenosine, and we're gonna talk about how digoxin will do the same type of effect here. Adenosine and digoxin are going to cause hyperpolarization. They're gonna make the cell very, very negative, and that's going to make it more difficult and take a longer time to go from this hyperpolarized state to threshold potential. So it's going to increase the time to the threshold potential. And that will decrease the amount of action potentials that you're gonna be able to generate because it's gonna take you a longer time to get to threshold potential to generate an action potential. Pretty cool concept. Okay, that's for adenosine. How does the joxin do this? The joxin is also pretty cool. So what happens is, you know your vagus nerve, your vagus nerve releases something called acetylcholine, right? So here's your vagus nerve 
nerve. Now the vagus nerve will act, will release acetylcholine, which will act on what's called muscarinic 2 receptors. Right? This is an adenosine receptor. This is a muscarinic 2 receptor. When acetylcholine binds onto this muscarinic 2 receptor, what it does is, it does the same exact process. It activates a gene inhibitory protein. And there's two components to that. One is the alpha and beta inhibitory subunit. And that'll go and inhibit adenylate cyclase, decrease ATP, decrease cyclic AMP, decrease protein kinase A, less phosphorylation, less calcium comes in. But that's very, very mild. It's more this effect that's the more potent effect where it inhibits the, I mean, sorry, it actually causes the stimulation of the gamma subunit. And the gamma subunit will come and bind onto these potassium channels. And they will cause the potassium channels to open. And potassium will leak out of the cell very powerfully and that'll cause the inside of the cell to become very electronegative. And this will cause, again, what type of effect here? Hyperpolarization, making the cell very negative, which will cause it to go to this hyperpolarized state, making it now have to work harder to be able to go from a, a negative potential all the way up to negative 40. It's a longer time to get to threshold potential, and that's gonna slow down the action potentials moving through the AV node. But, all right, we just talked about the vagus nerve here and how acetylcholine works. How does the joxin actually come into play here? The joxin has been shown through not a completely known mechanism here, but to stimulate the increase of acetylcholine release from the vagus nerve. And that will increase the activation of the alpha, beta, and gamma subunits that'll increase the activation of these potassium channels and that'll increase potassium exiting and that will increase hyperpolarization, make the cell super negative and now it's gonna have to go from like a negative 95 millivolts, I'm just using a random number here, it's just more negative uh, potential, it's gonna have to go from that potential all the way to threshold, which is more than it would have been from the normal resting membrane potential. Okay, so that's one of the interesting concepts of this drug category. So again, to recap this, adenosine digoxin still block the AV node and atrial arrhythmias, but to be more specific, they really only treat SVT, such as adenosine, and AFib, such as digoxin in patients with HEFREF, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. How do they do it? They hyperpolarize the AV nodal cell. They make the inside of the cell negative. Now it has to go from a very negative charge to rest to, I'm sorry, to the threshold potential. So giving an example, if the resting member potential was negative 70, I made the cell even more negative than that, negative 95. Now it has to go from negative 95 to negative 40 in comparison to negative 70 to negative 40. That's gonna take a longer time to get the threshold potential, a longer time to generate action potentials, and that decreases the conduction of action potentials through the AV node into the ventricles. Again, adenosine will do that via the G inhibitory process by causing potassium efflux. The joxin will increase vagal nerve stimulation causing increased acetylcholine release, which will also cause potassium efflux. These can, to a very mild degree, it's not even relevant though to put that on the graph, can mildly block the voltage-gated potassium channels. And so if you really wanted to, they theoretically could even decrease the slope of phase four, okay? And very mildly phase zero, but they're primarily hyperpolarizing the cell. All right, now that we've talked about these drugs, let's now come into the next category. We've talked about all the drugs that are utilized to suppress or block the conduction through the AV node. The beta blockers, the calcium channel blockers, adenosine and digoxin, using atrial arrhythmias to really rate control those patients. What about the diseases of the atrial and ventricular myocytes where instead of actually rate controlling, blocking the AV node, I try to block those cells, those triggered cells, reentrant cells, abnormal cells from firing and preventing them from having AFib or preventing them from going into AFLUD or preventing them from going to VTAC or preventing them from going into torsosda points, taking and converting them out of that abnormal rhythm into a normal rhythm. How do I utilize those drugs in this particular scenario and how's their mechanism of action gonna be working? Let's talk about that now. All right, so now let's talk about the sodium channel blockers, your class one type one antiarrhythmic drug category. Now, what are these utilized for? They're not gonna block the AV node. They're gonna to try to block those non-pacemaker tissues, those atrial and ventricular tissues that are generating abnormal rhythms. So remember I told you that maybe you have some type of abnormal triggered activity occurring within the atria and it's causing this atria to generate these really fast 
rates, right? Or maybe you have a reentrance circuit within the atria and it's causing to generate these very fast rates. Or maybe you have a ventricular focus here that's causing a lot of triggered activity. Or you have a ventricular focus that's creating a lot of reentrance circuits. Either way, you're not going to be able to, blocking the AV node in these ventricular circuits is not going to be helpful, right? It's more blocking the AV node for the atrial arrhythmias. Well, instead of me even blocking the AV node for these atrial arrhythmias, what if I just tried to get these atrial cells to stop firing, <laughs> okay? So particularly in diseases such as atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, what if I just go ahead and I kind of cardiovert them? In other words, I try to take and convert them from this abnormal rhythm that they're generating due to triggered activity or reentrant circuits, and I try to suppress those reentrant circuits or suppress the actual triggered activity and cause them to go back into normal sinus rhythm. Or what if I have a patient who's in VTAC or v, uh, what's called um, torsades de points of something of like that nature, or torsades de points, and I try to again cardiovert them? This may be where these drugs could potentially be useful. And we'll talk about that actually. Now, when we talk about these drugs, these uh, sodium channel blockers, what are some of them? There's a lot of them. And we actually are gonna talk about these in a subtype. So when we talk about sodium channel blockers, they're all gonna block the voltage gated sodium channels in those non pacemaker atrial and ventricular myocardial cardiomyocytes, all right? But they're gonna block a little bit differently and they have different names for the different subtypes. So there's class 1A, class 1B, and class 1C, or type 1A, type 1B, type 1C. With these, there's a lot of them names. So here's the way that I usually remember them. I remember for type 1A, it's double quarter pounder. So disopyramide, I sound so fat saying that, but that's the way I remember it. So disopyramide, so double quarter quinidine, quinidine, and then pounder, the most commonly utilized one here is procainamide. So double quarter pounder, with lettuce, so lidocaine is gonna be for the type B. So lidocaine, lidocaine. And the last one is, and fries please. So I'll take a double quarter pounder with lettuce and fries please. So flecainide and propofenone. So this is just the way that I remember these particular drug names is, again, type 1A, type 1B, type 1C, or class 1A, class 1B, class 1C. I remember double quarter pounder, disopyramide, quinidine, and brocainamide with lettuce, lidocaine, and fries, please, flocainamide and propofenone. With these drugs, they're all going to block the sodium channels, but the reason why we subclassify them is they block the sodium channels to some degree, a little bit different in response to the powerful, kind of like uh, the, the, the sense of how strongly they block the sodium channels. So in other words, type 1A, type 1B, type 1C, they can differ in the degree of blockage, the strength of blockage of the sodium channels. And we'll talk about that. I'll teach you a little trick to remembering that. But either way, here's this atrial or ventricular myocyte. And this is the cell who has, who's generating this triggered activity, he's the, he's the problem child, right? So he's in the atria, he's in the ventricle, and he's causing triggered activity, or he's in the ventricle cells and he's causing like these reentrant circuits. What I wanna do is, I wanna suppress, I wanna inhibit this cell from generating triggered activity or generating these reentrant circuits. How do I do that? How do I actually do that process? Well, I'm gonna give these drugs to block particularly the sodium channel. So here's my voltage-gated sodium channels. These are gonna allow for sodium to rush in to the cell. Now whenever sodium is, these voltage-gated sodium channels are open, they allow sodium to rush in and that causes the upstroke of the action potential, which is what phase? Phase zero. So all this is phase zero on the fast action potential to uh, producing tissue. Again, this is the non-pacemaker tissue. So these will not work very well or won't work really at all in the pacemaker tissues because there is no specific voltage-gated sodium channels on those tissues. That's important to remember. That's why they're gonna be more specific to the fast action potential producing tissue, such as the atrial and ventricular myocytes that are non-pacemaker tissue. But anyway, I'm gonna give these drugs. And what they're gonna do is, they're gonna block this sodium channel. If they block the sodium channel, they block the entry of sodium into the cell. And so they decrease the positive charges rushing into the cell and they decrease the upstroke of phase zero. So again, here is my phase zero. If we were to kind of go through this whole process, 
here's phase zero, here's phase one, here's phase two, here's phase three, and then here's phase four. And then phase four here as well. Same concept with this one, phase four. Phase zero is this upstroke with the sodium influx. Phase one is the potassium efflux. Phase two is the calcium influx and potassium efflux. Phase three is the primarily potassium efflux. Resting membrane potential via the sodium potassium channels. Zero is gonna be sodium influx. One is the potassium efflux. Two is the plateau with the calcium influx and potassium efflux. Three is primarily potassium efflux. And four is the resting membrane potential, okay? If I block the sodium entry <laughs> into this cell, I'm gonna reduce the upstroke, the rapid phase of the action potential in these triggered or reentrant atrial and ventricular cells. So now what's gonna happen is, I'm gonna notice a difference in the slope. I'm gonna decrease the upstroke. So instead of me having a very crisp rise in phase zero, it's gonna be very delayed, and it's gonna have a slope that moves this way now, which is gonna take a longer time for it to be able to generate these action potentials. And that's a really helpful concept. But the port important thing in here is knowing how strongly they do it, because this is what you'll be tested on on the exam. So here's the way I remember which one strongly blocks it to which one least strongly blocks it. So the most powerful sodium blocker out of these class 1A, class 1B, class 1C, I easily remember it by cab. So type 1C, type 1A, type 1B, or class 1A, class, 1, uh, class 1C, class 1A, uh, class 1B. So cab. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it will now look like. This is going to be the strongest. So this is going to have the most sodium blockade. So when I look at this, I'm not gonna have this very fast upstroke. I'm gonna have a very slow type of upstroke here. And here's the other thing that's interesting about this one. Because there's this very, very kind of very powerful kind of upstroke here, what happens is now I'm gonna have my plateau phase, but I'm gonna try to end this at the same time. It shouldn't really have any effect on the action potential duration. So the action potential duration is from the begin, the end of phase four, beginning of phase zero, all the way till we go back to phase four. So this is my action potential duration from here to here. I shouldn't have any effect on my action potential duration, but what I will see is a very kind of decreased slope or rise or upstroke in phase zero. But by again, my refractory period and my action potential duration should be the same, almost no effect, little to no effect. So what I'm gonna see is, look at my phase zero. It's shifted. Phase one, kind of the same. Phase two, kind of the same. Phase three, kind of the same. And then phase four, again, kind of the same here. But what I'm gonna notice is a decreased slope of phase zero. So what I'll notice here as the effect of the sodium channel blockade is I'm gonna notice a a decrease in the slope of phase zero. And that is the cool concept here of how this drug actually works. So this would be which drugs? This would be flecainide and propofenone. So these are actually utilized, and we'll talk about this later in patients with atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, sometimes even you can consider SVT to be able to maintain normal sinus rhythm to maintain normal sinus rhythm in patients who have atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter because they are the most powerful sodium channel blockers, okay? But have no, they should have no effect, no change. I, this is, I, I can't stress this enough. The action potential duration should be the same. I shouldn't have any change in my action potential duration. So that should be the same as compared to this black side with the blue ones, no change there. We come to the 1A, a little bit different. For these, these have, let's say, this one is the strongest, so we'll put three arrows. This one is gonna have like middle or moderate sodium channel blockade. So middle or moderate sodium channel blockade. So you're gonna see the same effect here with this type of drug. So this is gonna be, which ones? You're gonna see procainamide, disopyramide, and quinidine for the type 1As, okay? Double quarter pounder. With this, what you'll see is, they're gonna have a powerful sodium channel blockade, but just not as powerful. So it won't be shifted, the, uh, the, uh, the slope won't be as intensely shifted to the right. So we'll kind of go like right here. So you see how this one was more powerful? This one again, it's, it's not gonna be as intense. Now what's gonna be different here is this, watch this, this is what's interesting. You're gonna be like, wait, what? What happened to my action potential duration? The refractory period's longer now, so it's kind of more drawn out refractory period. But what you'll notice here is that my action potential duration is increased. 
Whoa. I have an increased action potential. Duration. I had no effect on the type 1C, but in the type 1A, there is this shifting of the phase zero, but then I have a prolonged kind of refractory period. We call this the refractory period, when potassium is kind of like leaving the cell in the phases. Once you kind of go into this downward phase here, you call that the refractory period. You have two parts of your refractory period. You're the effective um, refractory period is kind of the big way to think about it. But once this cell kind of ends its kind of depolarization and starts repolarizing, we're going into what's called your refractory period. Look what happens. It shifted to the right a little bit. That's weird. That means that type 1A drugs also have potassium channel blockade. That's one of the interesting things here. So this also has a little bit of potassium blockade. So because it blocks the potassium channels a little bit, you get a longer, it takes a longer time for this cell to repolarize. So the action potential duration is increased. So what I'll notice with this drug is that it will decrease the slope, the uh, upstroke of phase zero, and I notice that it'll actually cause a longer, it'll actually cause a longer repolarization period. So it'll increase what's called your effective refractory period. And that will increase your action potential duration. So again, what is the overall effect with this drug? It will decrease the slope of phase zero, but also increase the effective refractory period. So that will increase the action potential duration. This is primarily which drugs again? Procainamide, disopyramide, and quinidine. I can't stress this enough. This is the only one out of the sodium channel blockers that increases the effective refractory period and increases the action potential duration. Okay? So, so far we have the most sodium channel blockade, the middle sodium channel blockade with a little bit of potassium blockade. That's what's really interesting about this drug. Does this will decrease the upstroke of phase zero the most. This will decrease the upstroke of phase zero like in the moderate middle amount, but it also prolong the effective refractory period, increase action potential duration. Type 1B, so this is going to be lidocaine. This one's weird. It'll have the least amount of, the least amount of, so here we'll just put one arrow. So this had three arrows for type 1C, two arrows for type 1A. Um, this will only have one arrow, so it has a little bit of sodium blockade, the least amount out of all three of these subclasses. So because of that, if we were to look here, it's really not going to have a very profound effect here on the, uh, the upstroke. So this one had a very powerful, this one had a very powerful kind of delay, and this one's going to have a little bit of a delay here, all right? But here's what's also really interesting. Look what happens to the action potential duration. Oh, you're like, man, I can't remember all this stuff. How am I supposed to remember all this stuff? What I noticed here is that my phase zero is decreased slope. Not as powerful, but there is a decreased upstroke of phase zero. But what I notice is that my refractory period kind of like decreases a little bit. So now I notice that I shift this thing a little bit towards the left. This has nothing to do with the potassium channels. It's that, you know, usually with sodium channel blockers, there's different phases when you can block them. So you have different phases. You have what's called the resting state. Um, so when you go through these channels here, let's say that this is a, it's in the resting membrane potential. There's two gates. Usually, and whenever these patients are in what's called the resting state, their, their, their voltage gated sodium channels, so let's say resting membrane potential, this is when it's active, and this is when it's inactive, and then usually it kind of cycles back up to this point. So it's kind of like a circle here, it's a cycle, right? And the resting membrane potential, you have what's called your inactivation gates. These are usually open, but your activation gate is closed. What happens is once this cell becomes stimulated, it goes into this active configuration, which is where the activation gate is open, and the inactivation gate is open. And this is really the phase where lots of sodium ions are flooding in. And then you have the inactive state, which is basically where the, again, the inactivation gate closes here, but you still have the activation gate open. So this is the three configurations. What we see with the type 1B is that it might be able to kind of block this state, the type 1B, so the 1Bs can block here, and they've also been shown to block here, which really none of the other ones can do. And so this may alter to some degree the plateau phase. So it may alter the plateau phase and the repolarization period a little bit and shorten the action potential duration, which is really interesting. So that's one of the big things to remember here is that with this drug type 1B or the class 1B, the lidocaine, it will block the sodium channels. And if you do block the sodium channels very moderately, you will decrease the slope of phase zero but it also will decrease the action potential 
duration. And the way it may do that is by kind of keeping the sodium channels inhibited in both the active and inactive state. And so look at the action potential duration here now. The action potential duration is decreased. And that's what's really interesting about this drug category. So to quickly recap, sodium channel blockers. We're utilizing these, this is a class one. You got the drugs, class 1A, class 1B, class 1C. Double quarter pounder, again, with lettuce and fries, please. Disopyramide, quinidine, procainamide, lidocaine, flecainide, propofenone. That's how you remember those. What do they utilize for? They're utilized to cardiovert or to kind of shift people from these abnormal rhythms that are generated by these abnormal atrial or ventricular cells into a normal sinus rhythm. So we use this in AFib, A flutter, VTAC, maybe even torsades to points, okay? When we talk about these, how do they work? They block these so voltage-gated sodium channels and decrease the slope of phase zero. But on top of them all decreasing the slope of phase zero, some of them do it a little bit more powerfully than others. You can remember the strength of it by cab. So 1C, 1A, 1B, strongest with 1C, middle with 1A, the weakest with 1B. But then don't forget that with 1C, it has no effect on the actual potential duration. It doesn't affect the plateau phase, it doesn't affect the actual effect of refractory period. And so because of that, it only just strongly decreases the slope of phase zero. With 1A, it has sodium channel blockade, so it decreases the slope of phase zero, but it also has a little bit of potassium channel blockade, so it prolongs the refractory period, or the repolarization period. And so you may get an increase in actual potential duration. Whereas lidocaine, weakest sodium channel blocker, but because it may inhibit the sodium channels in both the active and inactive state, it may be able to not only decrease the upstroke of phase zero, but shorten the action potential duration. So it may affect the plateau phase, and it may also to some degree affect the effect of refractory period. And so because you shorten that kind of plateau phase a little bit, you shorten the action potential duration. And so that is another cool concept of these drugs. Now that we've talked about the sodium channel blockers, let's finish up with the last type of drug category here, which is your potassium channel blockers, your class three drugs. All right, my friends, class three antiarrhythmic drugs. Okay, so these ones are really cool, the potassium channel blockers. One of these I really, really like, but when we talk about the names of these, like, because there's a lot of names, right? So I think I helped you guys remember maybe the sodium channel blockers with the double quarter pounder with lettuce, you know, fries, please. With these ones, it's not the best mnemonic, but it works. It comes out from the first aid, um, uh, USMLE one, but usually you can remember AIDS, <laughs> so it's terrible, but this is amiodarone, amiodarone for the A, abutilide for the I, um, and then dofetilide, and then there's even another one called dronetarone, dofetilide, and then S for sotalol. So this is, you can remember these again with the mnemonic AIDS. Terrible one, but it works. So when we talk about these particular drugs, what are they actually going to be utilized for? It's the same concept that we talked about with the sodium channel blockers. We're utilizing this in particular diseases where you have an atrial focus or a ventricular focus that are not a pacemaker tissue that are generating these triggered activity or reentrant circuits, and what you're trying to do is to shut down the ventricular atrial tissue from generating these abnormal rhythms. So in diseases such as atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, you're utilizing these to rhythm control these patients or to cardiovert them in some particular way to either maintain normal sinus rhythm or switch them back to normal sinus rhythm. That's what you're trying to utilize it for. And the other one is VTAC. And again, you're trying to cardiovert these patients. You're trying to stop that ventricular focus from generating these very abnormal triggered activity or reentrant circuits and shut that down so that they can regenerate a normal sinus rhythm. So again, when we talk about cardioversion, there's obviously one thing that I didn't mention here is we can chemically cardiovert patients. That's what we're using with these type one and type three antiarrhythmic drugs. But you can also use electricity to cardiovert a patient out of atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or VTAC into a normal sinus rhythm. But we'll talk about some of the downsides to utilizing chemical cardioversion and why electricity actually may be potentially superior. But we'll talk about some of the downsides as well that you have to be careful with when you're cardioverting a patient. One of those, if I mention it right here, if a patient has atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, they're at high risk of what's called atrial thrombi, so they can form clots within their left atrium. If you cardiovert them, 
they now gain that actual atrial kickback and they can break off a clot and then embolize that and cause a stroke. So it's important to remember that whenever we cardiovert a patient who has AFib, um, despite if we're doing it with electricity or with these drugs like amiodarone, abutilide, defetilide, sodalol, the type one sodium channel blockers, whatever we're doing, if we're converting the patient, we better make sure that we either watch that they don't have a clot within their left atrium, because if that's the case, we should anticoagulate those patients for a little bit before we actually do it or continue anticoagulation afterwards. So very important to be able to remember that. But either way, when we utilize these drugs, how are they particularly working? They're blocking the voltage-gated potassium channels. So with the voltage-gated sodium channels, that was here, right? So we have the phases here that are respective here. We have phase four, which is the resting membrane potential. That's due to the sodium potassium pumps. Then you have phase zero. Phase zero was the sodium influx via the voltage-gated sodium channels. Then you have phase one. Phase one is what, what channel opens up. Do you guys remember? These two channels. So potassium channels should open up and calcium channels should open up. But potassium channels will open up quicker and potassium will exit a little bit early. And so this is gonna be phase one. That's the potassium channels leaving. Then phase two is when calcium is entering in and potassium is exiting out. So that's the plateau phase. And then calcium channels close and the only one that's open here is going to be potassium and that's phase three. So potassium channels are open at what phases? Three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So if what we do is we give a drug like amiodarone, abutilide, defetilide, or sodalol, what they are doing is, is they are blocking the potassium channels from opening at all three of these phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So what you'll see is that with this drug with blue, you'll see the same phase zero. But what you'll notice is that phase one, less potassium is going to be leaking out. So what it's gonna do is, it's going to decrease potassium efflux. If you decrease potassium efflux, e the potassium won't leave as easily. So now you're going to decrease the rate at which potassium starts to cause that drop. And you're also going to decrease the potassium leaving during the plateau phase. And then on top of that, you're gonna decrease the amount of potassium that's leaving during the repolarization period. And it's gonna take a longer time for it to get back to resting membrane potential. So what you'll see here is this very prolonged action potential duration. Look what happens to the action potential duration from the beginning here to all the way here in comparison to what it was here to here. The action potential duration is increased. The refractory period is increased. So you have an increase in your refractive refractory period and you have an increase in the action potential duration. So now it's gonna be in this repolarization period a lot longer, and it's gonna be harder to re-stimulate this agitated tissue, which is great in situations of atrial and ventricular tachyrrhythmias. Just like in the sodium channel blockers, you're decreasing the upstroke, you're decreasing its ability to generate these fast action potentials inside of those tissues, which is gonna slow the upstroke of phase zero. Here, you're causing a prolonged repolarization period, decreasing its ability to be stimulated again. So the same thing here, now look at this one. It's gonna have this next point here where it's in the repolarization period. It should still have a normal phase zero, but what you're gonna see here is you're gonna see a very prolonged kind of phase one, two, and three. And so because of that, the effective refractory period will be significantly increased. So to summate here, what do we see with the potassium channel blockers? What we're seeing with potassium channel blockade is we're causing a decrease in potassium efflux. So a decrease in potassium efflux. Less potassium is leaving, and that's going to be occurring in what phases? Phase one, phase two, but most important, phase three. And what that's gonna do is, all three of these phases, if that's slowed down, it's going to prolong the effective refractory period and increase the action potential duration in both atrial and ventricular cells. And that's gonna to help to be able to suppress these atrial cells and ventricular cells from generating these fast triggered activity reentrant circuits causing these tachyarrhythmias. Isn't that cool? Now, we've talked about these drugs pretty effectively, right? Amiodarone, we've talked about abutilide, defetilide, sodalol, there's even another one called dronetarone. One of the big things to remember, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit more to really kind of nail down on this concept is,
Some of these drugs work more to suppress the ventricular tissue and less of them um, can actually, some of them will be able to only suppress ventricular tissue and pretty much all of them can suppress atrial tissue. But it's important to remember that primarily what we'll talk about a little bit later is really only amiodarone and sodalol are utilized here in the ventricular tissue suppression. But they will not, uh, the, the um, uh, abutilide, defetilide, dronetarone, those won't be as effective or really effective at all in the ventricular tissue suppression. They all are good for atrial, uh, atrial tissue, so atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, cardioverting that tissue, all of them are effective. But for the ventricular the tachycardia, only amiodarone and sodalol will be effective. And again, we'll talk about it a little bit later. So, up to this point, we've discussed action potentials in both pacemaker tissues and non-pacemaker tissues. We talked about all the channels that are involved. We talked about all the phases and what they look like graphically. We talked about the approach to how we're going to target arrhythmias. Some will suppress the AV node for a lot of the atrial arrhythmias to rate control those patients, especially in AFib, A flutter, SVT. We talked about how beta blockers do that, calcium channel blockers do that, adenosine, digoxin do that. Then what we did is we took and we said, okay, we know how those drugs block the pacemaker tissues, how they decrease the slope of phase four, phase zero, how they hyperpolarize the cell and make it harder to get to threshold potential. What about the atrial and ventricular tissue that's not pacemaker tissue? They're trigger generating triggered activity. They're generating some type of reentrant circuit. And you're not caring about suppressing the AV node to suppress the atrial input. You're trying to stop those tissues from generating those arrhythmias and convert them and rhythm control them and switch them back into normal sinus. That's where we use class one and class three drugs. Sodium channel blockers to decrease the upstroke of phase zero. Some of them can even increase the action potential duration, increasing the effective refractory period. One of them can even decrease the action potential duration, right? Then we talked about the potassium channel blockers, how they also prolong or increase the effective refractory period and increase the action potential duration. Either way, if we're decreasing the upstroke or prolonging the refractory period, it makes it harder for those atrial and ventricular tissues to generate triggered activity, to generate reentrant circuits and cause those tachyarrhythmias. But what I want to do now is because you hit with so much information, let's summate. If a patient comes in and you're the one responsible for taking care of them, hey doc, you got a patient in atrial fibrillation right now, what do you want to do? You need to know, are you going to rate control, rhythm control, what's the drug of choice in this particular situation, and what may be some potential like conditions that you have to be aware of that they may not respond better to this one in comparison to this one. So if a patient comes up and they have one of these arrhythmias, how do we go about treating it with all the agents that we talked about, putting the depths of the mechanism of action and all the stuff for aside now saying, okay, quick, quick, you know, clinical approach here, patient has this disease, what do you give them and why? Let's talk about that. You have a patient who's in atrial fibrillation or they're in atrial flutter. The nice thing about kind of combining those is that regardless of their kind of pathogenesis or the actual disease itself, you kind of treat atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter relatively the same. So if I have a patient who's having a reentrant circuit because of AFib, or they have a reentrant circuit because of atrial flutter, or they have a triggered activity because of AFib, whatever, they're generating these very fast electrical activities that are trying sometimes up to 300 beats per minute, and they're trying to generate these fast electrical activities to move through the AV node into the ventricles and make the ventricles beat at a similar or very fast rate that the atria are beating at. And so that's a very dangerous concept. So what I want to do is I want to shut down the AV node. So all the electrical activity that's moving through the atria towards the S, uh, AV, AV node, and then from AV node down into the ventricles, I'm going to shut the AV node down and say, hey, don't allow for a lot of that electrical activity that's coming from the atrial cells that are agitated or re-entrant circuits that they're generating to go down into the ventricles. Shut it down and only allow for some of the electrical activity to go down. And so that's what it's really doing. And so when we do that, we rate control them, we try to, to block the, so what you're doing with this one is you're inhibiting the AV node. This is your beta blockers, your calcium channel blockers. That's gonna be the drugs. And then one more for AFib, A-flutter, particularly AFib, digoxin. So this would be what drugs? Your beta blockers. This will be your calcium channel blockers. And this will be digoxin. But again, when we talk about digoxin, they have to have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. That's really the primary indication of this drug because it's a positive inotropic agent. So it'll help to increase the contractility of the heart. And if you give it to a patient who has AFib and congestive heart failure with a reduced EF, you may get a double kind of benefit from those two particular drugs.
All right, so that's gonna be rate controlling the patient, suppressing the AV node. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin. You're probably like, what about adenosine, Zach? Doesn't it block the AV node? Remember I told you, it's so short acting that it will have no long lasting benefit in patients who have atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. What about a patient who has atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter and you're trying to now suppress those triggered atrial cells right, or the reentrant circuits from those atrial cells that are being developed and causing these fast rates to run down into the ventricles, right? So in other words, patient has AFib, A flutter, you can rate control them by blocking the pacemaker cells, particularly the AV node, and to reduce the amount of electrical potentials that's going from the atrium to the ventricles. What if we just shut off those triggered, triggered atrial cells or reentrant circuits in those atrial cells? We shut those off and we just maintain or convert a patient into normal sinus rhythm. Wouldn't that be beneficial? So that's called your cardioversion. So what we're trying to do is not inhibit the AV nodal cells, we're trying to inhibit the non-pacemaker cells. So remember I told you, if you're suppressing AV node, that's your beta blockers, so that's class two. If you're trying to do the, you know, this one for calcium channel blockers, that's class four. And the is kind of one of those miscellaneous class fives. We don't use adenosine because it's too short acting. But in this particular population for cardioversion of the non-pacemaker cells, that's the sodium channel blockers and potassium channel blockers that are really good. So I can use type one agents. And I can use, out of those type one agents, I can use one A, or I could use one um, C. So with type one A, all right, this is the double quarter pounder, so disopyramide, quinidine, and percanamide, the most commonly utilized one here is going to be Procainamide, procainamide. And really what we're utilizing this drug for is in what's called WPW plus they have atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. So if they have atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, a pre-excitation syndrome and an accessory pathway, this is a super scary poop in your huggies kind of like drug uh, disease process. Because what can happen is when a patient has this accessory pathway and they have a very pre-excited heart, the electrical activity could run right through that accessory pathway into the ventricles. So if the atria is generating beats of 3 to 100 to 350 beats per minute, and it has this little electrical window besides the AV node that it can go through into the ventricles, your atria can cause your ventricles to beat at the same rate. That could cause V-fib instantly and cause the patient to die. So in this particular situation, it's important to remember that we can give type 1, your sodium channel blockers, sodium channel blockers, like procainamide, primarily in WPW and AFib or a flutter. Just avoid anything that suppresses the AV node if they have this. Don't give them adenosine. Don't give them beta blockers. Don't give them calcium channel blockers. Don't give them digoxin because you can create this really nasty circuit for these patients and kill them. For type 1C, this is either one of them. So this is both. This is going to be the fries, please. So flecainide and propofenone. For these ones, you can actually use this in AFib or a flutter. Um, but one of the big things that I think is important to remember with this drug is they can have no like coronary artery disease, no heart failure, no LVH. If they have any of these things, it can kill the patient if you give them this drug. Because these drugs, type 1C, which we'll talk about later, is pro-arrhythmic. Especially if a patient just had an MI, if they're post-MI, so that's another thing. If they, if they have no coronary artery disease, heart failure, LVH, and for the love of goodness, no MI, do not, you can give them this drug category, flecainide or propofenone, but if they have these, you could kill them because you could actually put them into a pro state, cause them to go into ventricular fibrillation. So the only indication for this drug is atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. It's more of an outpatient type of drug. So we utilize this more kind of treatment as outpatient. It's kind of a pill in a pocket approach to be able to maintain normal sinus rhythm in patients who have atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, but do not have any of these diseases. Do not give them that drug. If they have these diseases, you'll kill them. All right, so we got the sodium channel blockers type 1A and type 1C that we can utilize as cardioversion therapy. The other one is your type or class 3 drugs. This is your potassium channel blockers. For these ones, we can use any of them amiodarone, abutilide, defetilide, sotolol, any of those drugs. These are also going to be beneficial, again, to be able to convert a patient who is an acute AFib or a flutter. You can switch them over into normal sinus rhythm and even maintain them in normal sinus rhythm. One of the best ones for converting them immediately is amiodarone. 
um, or a butylide, but again, any of these agents could be potentially utilized for the class three or type three types of antiarrhythmic drugs, the potassium channel blockers. So again, patient has AFib, a flutter. Your decision comes down to, am I rate controlling them or rhythm controlling them, cardioverting them? Well, if I'm gonna rate control, I'm suppressing the pacemaker cells, particularly AV node. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, don't do adenosine because it's too short acting, or digoxin if they have HEFREF. If I'm not going to rate control them, I'm going to try to suppress those agitated or reentrant circuits in the atrial and ventricular cells that are not pacemaker tissues. So I'm going to give sodium channel blockers or potassium channel blockers. If I give sodium channel blockers, it's only type 1, a and type 1C. Type 1A is only really good in patients who have WPW and AFib. Type 1C is in patients who have no CAD, no heart failure, no LVH, and no post-MI. If you give them that drug, you will kill them. It's primarily outpatient medication, pill in a pocket approach, to maintain normal sinus or to convert them in an outpatient setting. Type 1C, I'm sorry, uh, type 3, you can use any of them, amiodarone, defetilide, abutilide, sodalol, any of them are going to be beneficial in converting the patient to normal sinus rhythm. Amiodarone will probably be the best one. The way that we pick which one sometimes depends upon the adverse drug reactions of those drugs, okay? But that's the concept there. Okay, now that we got AFib, a flutter down, what about SVT? So a patient develops an SVT. You can rhythm control these patients, however, it's not usually the, the preferred approach. Usually the most preferred approach with SVT is going to be more of the AV nodal blockade. So with SVT, you're gonna try to suppress the AV node. You're gonna try to suppress a lot of the electrical activity that's going from the atria into the ventricles via the AV node. So if I'm going to do this acutely, so acutely, the drug of choice is adenosine. So a patient comes in, they're in SVT, they're hypotensive, they're symptomatic, and we want to abort the SVT, adenosine is gonna be the best drug because it'll acutely suppress their AV node and get them back into a normal sinus rhythm. You can give it as a six milligram bolus, and then if that doesn't work, a 12 milligram bolus. But after that, after they have converted, and they've actually, you've suppressed the AV node enough that it actually put them back into normal sinus, then what you can do is a prophylactic therapy to prevent them from going back into uh, SVT, as you can again give them drugs that'll always keep kind of suppressing the AV node and give it in lower doses such as a beta blocker or a calcium channel blockers. Okay? So that is the concept that I want you guys to remember. So again, SVT, you're going to block the AV node. A lot of the electrical activity from these atrial cells moving into the AV node and into the ventricles, you're going to suppress the AV node. You can do that with acutely adenosine or prophylactically to maintain their normal sinus beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. The Joxin is not helpful in SVT. Okay, what else? Okay, now here's the other thing I want you to think about. With the atrial cells, we've talked a lot about the atrial tissue. There's another particular situation here. So you know atrial cells, sometimes they can develop triggered activity, but it's not sustained. So in other words, they generate this electrical activity that's faster than the SA node, or it suppresses the SA node, but it's not a continuous sustained activity. And these sometimes can occur within the atria called PACs, premature atrial complexes. This is usually due to increased sympathetic nervous system activity. So what if I give a drug that inhibits the epinephrine and norepinephrine from increased sympathetic activity on beta receptors? What drug category would be best to suppress PACs? Beta blockers. So I would inhibit this by giving beta blockers. Okay, all right. The next concept here, if I have a patient who has what's called torsades de points. So torsades de points is basically what's called a polymorphic VTAC with a prolonged QT interval. So in other words, a patient is taking multiple drugs. There's so many drugs that can cause a prolonged QT interval. It could be antiarrhythmics. And so this is what we'll talk about in a little bit. Which antiarrhythmics did you notice increase the action potential duration? So if you increase the action potential duration, you increase the QT interval. Do you guys remember? For the sodium channel blockers, it was the type 1A. And then all the potassium channel blockers increased the effective refractory period and the action potential duration. So they also increased QT interval. So antiarrhythmics such as type 1A and uh, type 3, or class 3, um, uh, and, and antiarrhythmic drugs could prolong the QT interval and increase the risk of torsades. Antibiotics like macrolides, tetracyclines, um, fluoroquinolones, things like that, they can also increase the QT interval. Antipsychotics, so any kind of antipsychotic agent can actually increase the QT interval. So things like haloperidol, things like um, 
uh, what's called Seroquel or uh, also known as quetiapine. So there's, there's all these different drugs that have the ability to increase the QT interval. Um, antipsychotics, antidepressants, so tricyclic antidepressants, antiemetics like ondansetron or metoclopramide. All those things can increase the QT interval, which can increase the risk of torsades to points. So you wanna give things that can reduce the QT interval. And so if you can reduce the QT interval, you can reduce the risk of torsades to points. Well, what things reduce the QT interval? Do you remember the one antiarrhythmic I told you, it was, again, it was one of the class ones, that actually shortened the actual potential duration? It was only one of them. It was the class one B, lidocaine. So I could actually give what's called a type or class one B drug such as lidocaine. Why? Because it, yes, not only did it actually reduce the sodium channel entry, so it decreased the slope of phase zero by sodium channel blockade, but it also caused a little decrease in the action potential duration. If I decrease action potential duration, I'll decrease QT interval. All right, what else? Another one is magnesium. We don't really know exactly how, but it actually magnesium has been shown to be one of the most effective things at reducing the QT interval. And then one more. Anything that increases the heart rate will actually decrease the action potential duration and decrease the QT interval. So I want to give things to increase the patient's heart rate. So I can give things like isoproteranol or I can actually pace the patient and that will increase the heart rate. But one of the biggest things I think that's important to remember here is torsades de points is due to drugs or things that increase QT interval. Discontinue the drugs that increase QT interval. So discontinue those drugs. Give them magnesium, that's the most important one. Consider lidocaine because that will also reduce the QT interval and then you can try to increase the patient's heart rate. This is not really relevant to antiarrhythmic drugs, but it just tells you how you would treat this. You can increase the heart rate, because if you increase the heart rate, you shorten their action potential duration, because their heart's beating faster, they have less of a diastolic heart rate, a period. And so their QT interval will decrease, and that reduces the torsades to points. But either way, that's the, ones, the things I want you to think about, with the most important ones being magnesium and lidocaine, because these are antiarrhythmics. Okay. What about the other concepts here? What about patients who develop PVCs? So again, usually PVCs and VTAC, there's some type of increased sympathetic nervous system activity. So what if I could give drugs that inhibits the sympathetic effect here, which would reduce a lot of the PVCs from generating triggered activity or ventricular cells from causing a lot of ventricular tachycardia? This would be beta blockers. So beta blockers tend to be very beneficial at suppressing the PVCs as well as suppressing ventricular tachycardia due to increased sympathetic nervous system activity. Okay, if I'm trying to also take these ventricular cells that are triggered, all right, so they're generating triggered activity, whether it be EADs, um, usually EADs is torsades to points, but DADs, so delayed after depolarizations causing ventricular tachycardia, or reentrant circuits causing ventricular tachycardia or a lot of sympathetic drive causing this ventricular tachycardia. What I wanna do is I want to suppress and take those ventricular cells that are kind of beating at very fast rates and just suppress them and stop them from generating VTAC. So what drugs would do that? Sodium channel blockers, which are your class one, and potassium channel blockers, class three, because those are the ones that are targeting what type of cells? Non-pacemaker cells. I need to inhibit the non-pacemaker cells, those ventricular monocytes. So I'm gonna use, which ones? I'm gonna use class one, okay, or class three. Now with the class one, there's really only two drug categories. Type one C, no. You do not give type one C or class one C and VTAC, but you can consider one A and you can consider one B. One A, you can give quinidine, uh, maybe even potentially uh, pro uh, procainamide, but generally these are usually last line. We do not go to these right away. These are usually last line. Okay, so if a patient is an in VTAC, you're not gonna be reaching for procainamide, you're not gonna be reaching for quinidine as a first line agent. It's something that you could consider, but it's not first line. Sometimes in textbooks, they'll actually put down um, in patients of what's called Brugada syndrome. Uh, Brugada syndrome is usually when the patients have um, uh, usually some type of like right bundle branch block, some ST segment elevations in like their uh, kind of uh, beginning parts of their precordial leads. Usually in those particular scenarios, and they have increased risk of VTAC, you can give them things like quinidine. 
Um, but again, I wouldn't be too crazy about remembering that fact. Uh, Procainamide is another one that you can actually utilize to suppress the ventricular cells, but again, it's not going to be your first line agents. And disopyramide, don't worry about that one. The 1B is the one I would actually remember for the, for the sodium channel blockers. For 1B, this is going to be, again, your lidocaine. This is actually an important fact to remember that these, are, these sodium channel blockers are the best in patients who just had a myocardial infarction. Post-MI, if a patient just had a myocardial infarction, they infarcted their myocardial tissue, they have increased risk of triggered activity, they have increased risk of re entering tachycardias, and they can go into VTAC. One of the uh, sodium channel blockers that is the best after a patient had an MI is going to be lidocaine. So remember that fact. Class 1A, not as great, not your first line agent. The next one is going to be the class 3, or your type 3 antiarrhythmics. So this is going to be your potassium channel blockers. So type 1 is the sodium channel blockers, and then type 3 is going to be the potassium channel blockers. What did I tell you out of all these? Which ones? Out of the AIDS, <laughs> that's a terrible thing, amiodarone, abutilide, defetilide, dronetarone, and uh, sotalol. Which ones were primarily only effective in ventricular tissue that's caused trigger activity or lots of re entrant circuits? Amiodarone and sotalol. So out of those, and if a patient goes into VTAC, amiodarone is usually the most commonly utilized one out of all of these, really. Um, and then sotalol is another one that you can potentially consider. But when a patient is post-MI, lidocaine should be first. If a patient did not have an MI and the MI is not the responsible cause of their VTAC, amiodarone is a very, very good drug that people will reach for. Sotalol is another one to consider. Beta blockers are another one to add on. Just again, usually for you know, patients who have VTAC, we don't automatically go to procainamide or quinidine. Uh, again, remember the quinidine factor, the Brugada syndrome, but if a patient goes into VTAC, it's post-MI, lidocaine. If it's not post-MI, amiodarone and sotalol tend to be one of the more beneficial agents, and then to suppress the sympathetic nervous system effect that could be worsening their VTAC, give beta blockers, okay? I hope that makes sense. All right, we've had a patient now that we've gone through, and we've talked about if they have this uh, arrhythmia, how do you treat it? The next thing that I need you guys to realize whenever you will give an antiarrhythmic agent to these patients, all right, from one of these particular scenarios, is what are the adverse effects that maybe deter you from using this agent over another agent, or you put this medication on and the patient develops this adverse drug reaction. You need to know is that expected or not expected? Is that a little bit different? Okay, so I need to be able to recognize things that I have watch out for when I give these medications to patients. So how do I talk about adverse drug reactions? Let's get into that now. All right, my friends, we're gonna move on to adverse drug reactions. So you have a patient who comes in, they have a particular arrhythmia, you start treating them with this drug. So let's say you have a patient who's an AFib, a flutter, SVT, you give them a beta blocker. What are the things that you should be careful of and be cautious of and realize are potential adverse drug reactions? When you give a beta blocker, they're suppressing the AV node, my friends. So if you suppress the AV node, you're suppressing a lot of electrical activity from going into the heart. So if you give a pretty good hefty dose of a beta blocker, you could actually suppress the AV node so significantly that almost no electrical activity goes from the atrium to the ventricles. You can develop like an AV block. So watch out for that. It may cause bradycardia. That may be one potential thing to watch out for, is a low heart rate because it's really suppressing the electrical activity via the AV node from the atrium to the ventricles. It may potentially cause an AV block. So you wanna watch out for those potential effects. The other thing is that not only do you inhibit the AV node, you inhibit the contractility. So you inhibit the contractility of your myocardial cells. Because if you inhibit those cells, you can actually reduce contractility, the squeeze of the heart. And so if I reduce contractility, the downside to that is that that can reduce cardiac output. So if I reduce cardiac output, that could cause the patient's blood pressure to tank. And the indication of the particular situations of where it could cause the blood pressure to tank is in patients who have what's called decompensated heart failure. So watch out for that. If a patient has decompensated heart failure, so they're in very like significant heart failure with cardiogenic shock, don't give them a beta blocker, you could really kill them. So be careful and cognizant of that. So again, watch out for bradycardia, particularly sinus bradycardia, watch out for AV blocks with very high doses, and watch out for reduced contractility that can drop cardiac output and blood pressure in decompensated heart failure patients. Next thing, there's beta-2 receptors. So this is all via the blockade of beta-1 receptors in the heart. But what about the beta-2 receptors that are present on the bronchial smooth muscle. So naturally, when you hit those beta-2 receptors in the bronchial smooth muscle, it causes bronchodilation. If you block them, if you inhibit the beta-2 receptors, especially with like propanolol, you can actually cause bronchospasm. 
And if you cause bronchospasm, that can definitely cause a lot more significant worsening in patients with like COPD or patients with asthma. That will really worsen them. So be cognizant of that if a patient has these two particular diseases. The other thing is that when you know when patients have low blood glucose levels, so whenever they have what's called hypoglycemia, so if a patient has hypoglycemia, maybe it's because their blood glucose is low, they took too much insulin, whatever it may be, and in these situations, what you're supposed to do is this hypoglycemia will kind of increase the sympathetic outflow. So it'll increase the sympathetic outflow and increase the sympathetic effects to make you aware that your blood glucose is low. So making you kind of your heart rate beat a little bit faster, give you palpitations, it may cause you to become like tremors. So you may develop tremors, you may develop a lot of diaphoresis. And so these are some of the potential signs of hypoglycemia. If you give a beta blocker, what you're doing is you're suppressing the sympathetic nervous system effect. So if I give a beta blocker, I'm hitting the sympathetic nervous system effect. So I'm inhibiting both the, maybe the beta one, so that's causing my tachycardia, and I'm inhibiting some of the beta two receptors that may be causing some of the tremors. I'm inhibiting kind of the uh, diaphoretic process. And so because of that, I lose my ability to be aware of my hypoglycemia. So this can cause what's called hypoglycemia, unawareness because you're blunting the sympathetic nervous system response. So a very, very important thing to watch out for in these patients who have what's called diabetes. So hypoglycemia unawareness in patients who have diabetes, be very cautious of. Another kind of thing that you really want to watch out for is if a patient is taking booger sugar, so they're taking something called cocaine. Now what cocaine can do is it really powerfully binds onto the alpha-1 receptors. When you bind onto alpha-1 receptors, that causes intense vasoconstriction. And when you cause vasoconstriction, what you do is you increase systemic vascular resistance and increase the patient's blood pressure, okay? Now, cocaine can bind onto alpha-1 receptors and beta-2 receptors. And if it binds onto beta-2 receptors, what that's gonna do is, when these are stimulated, they cause vasodilation. And if you vasodilate, you reduce systemic vascular resistance, and that will actually work to uh, reduce your blood pressure. Okay, so you see how it's kind of like a, there's a balance between these two. Now, if I give a beta blocker, a beta blocker is going to block cocaine from being able to bind onto the beta-2 receptors. So here I'm going to give a beta blocker, and the beta blocker, so this is a beta-2 receptor blocker, such as like propanolol, what it'll do is it'll block the cocaine from binding onto the beta-2 receptors. So that'll decrease the vasodilation it'll decrease the kind of systemic vascular resistance effect and only allow for cocaine to bind onto the alpha-1 receptors, which will increase the vasoconstriction effect, increase systemic vascular resistance, and shoot the BP up even more. So really one of the things that you want to be very, very cautious of is not giving beta blockers in patients who have cocaine-induced hypertension. Because when you give them that drug, you're blocking cocaine from binding to the beta-2 receptors, which is causing vasodilation. So now, now you have less vasodilatory effect and you're allowing it for it to have unopposed action on the alpha-1 receptors, which is gonna cause an intense vasoconstrictive response and increase your blood pressure. So just be cognizant of that. If a patient has cocaine in their system, they're hypertensive, maybe they're tachycardic related to that, and you give them a beta blocker, they will now have unopposed alpha-1 vasoconstriction and shoot their blood pressure up even more. So be careful of that. All right, calcium channel blockers, what are things to watch out for? Well, again, my friends, you're blocking and inhibiting the AV node. Because of that, if you block the AV node, watch out for bradycardia, right? Watch out for potentially an AV blockade. These are things to be cognizant of and think about. The other thing is that you're inhibiting the contractility, because calcium, L-type calcium channels are also present on the contractile portion of the heart. So you're inhibiting that, which can reduce contractility. If you reduce contraction of the myocardium, you're going to reduce the, what? Cardiac output and reduce the blood pressure. This could be catastrophic in patients who have decompensated heart failure. So in this one with beta blockers, they say you really be cautious about giving beta blockers in decompensated heart failure. Do not give calcium channel blockers in decompensated heart failure. You will put them in a cardiogenic shock, okay? The other thing is that calcium channel blockers will also block the calcium that are present on the smooth muscles of the GI tract. And so, you know, smooth muscles are supposed to contract the GIT muscles and cause you know, you're a poop. But now if I block that effect, I'm actually gonna decrease my GI motility. If I decrease GI motility, I ain't gonna poop. And so this is gonna lead to constipation. So other things to be cognizant of as well with these drugs. The other thing is that they can also relax your blood vessels. So they can actually cause vasodilatory effect.
And so they may actually cause a little bit of hypotension, but also they can cause, uh, sometimes uh, when they cause a vasodilation uh, effect, you can't even see some kind of like a edema effect with these drugs. But again, calcium channel blockers are class four, and then beta blockers are class two. We now know their adverse drug reactions to watch out for. Big thing, suppressing the AV node, causing bradycardia, AV block, decompensated heart failure. Do not give these drugs. They can suppress your cardiac output. Bronchospasm, hypoglycemia unawareness, and then cocaine-induced hypertension, it can actually cause a worsening vasoconstriction. With this calcium channel blocker, they can also cause constipation. Okay, let's come down and talk about the next one, which is adenosine. All right, my friends, adenosine. If we give this drug to a patient who has SVT, so we talked about beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, those are good in AFib, AFLUD, or SVT, really as a rate control agent. Adenosine can give an SVT acutely to abort them out of SVT. What are the things that you want to watch out for? When you give this drug, it's, it's super short acting, but the side effects that you can get from that kind of like short acting effect um, is very intense. So sometimes it can cause a very interesting type of like sense of impending doom. That's one of the weird things that happens with this drug. H how that actual like, you know, pathophysiology occurs, I'm not completely understanding of. But one of the things that's really interesting is that adenosine can cause vasodilation of the coronary vessels. But when it causes vasodilation of the coronary vessels, it can't do it of the plaque up vessels. So when you give adenosine, what it'll do is, adenosine will work and actually cause coronary artery vasodilation. So it'll vasodilate the healthy coronary vessels, but won't be able to vasodilate the plaque up vessels. So now, imagine here you have kind of like this vessel that you're trying to feed into these two bifurcating coronary vessels. This one is not gonna dilate, this puppy's gonna get big as ever. And now, what's gonna happen? You're gonna be able to have blood flow just rushing through this one, and the blood flow that was supposed to be going to this coronary vessel, you're gonna steal it and then rush it down through this vessel. Because blood likes to flow from, you know, in areas of, you know, uh, high resistance to low resistance. Well, if I have a lot of resistance because of this big plaque, I'm not gonna allow blood to flow there. So I'm gonna steal it, and it's gonna go to this coronary vessel. And so now the blood flow through here is gonna be very diminished. Now the myocardium will suffer and undergo hypoxia and ischemia, and this will lead to chest pain. And this is called coronary steel syndrome. So this can cause coronary steel syndrome, which can lead to a chest pain. The other thing is it actually can act on some smooth muscle cells here present in the bronchial smooth muscle and cause bronchospasm. So just be careful of it. It actually can cause some degree of bronchospasm, very short lived, but it can cause that. So it can cause chest pain, a sense of impending doom, bronchospasm. It also can vasodilate the, the actual smooth muscle of our blood vessels. And the blood vessels near the skin very intensely, so you have a lot of blood flow through the actual skin capillaries. And so if I have an increased blood flow through the actual skin capillaries, what this will do is this will give kind of a flushing appearance. So the patient may look flushed. The other thing is it can actually bind onto some of the aden adenosine receptors on the arterioles and cause them to vasodilate. And if they vasodilate, then what you do is you decrease systemic vascular resistance and decrease the blood pressure. So it may even cause a little bit of hypotension. So things to watch out for with adenosine is it can cause coronary steel syndrome, which can cause chest pain, a sense of impending doom, which we don't know how. It can cause bronchospasm. It can cause flushing of the cutaneous, it can cause flushing via the vasodilation of cutaneous vessels. And it can cause a temporary or transient hypotension due to arterial vasodilation. This is the adverse effects to watch out for with adenosine. Okay. Now let's move on to the next one, which is the Joxin. All right, the Joxin. What about this son of a gun? All right, so this type five antiarrhythmic drugs, when we talk about the Joxin, we know that we can use it in patients who have AFib with a reduced ejection fraction, right? Specifically AFib and heart failure patients with a reduced EF, we kind of have a double whammy with that drug. You can increase the contractility of their heart and you can also block their AV node. What are some downsides to this drug? One of the big things to remember is that it's a sodium potassium channel blocker on the actual um, contractile portion of the myocardial cells. So we talked about its effect on the AV nodal cells, which was to increase vagal nerve outflow. So one of the big things to think about here is that since digoxin did have this ability to increase, this is your vagus nerve, right? So this is the 10th nerve. So your cranial nerve number 10. So you're gonna increase the outflow of acetylcholine. So you're gonna increase the acetylcholine release from the vagus nerve. So it has the ability to do that. Because of that, you may see a lot of cholinergic types of side effects. And so watch out, particularly for like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, some like blurry or like vision changes and things of that effect. But these are some of the things to watch out for. When it comes to the other activity, so we talked about how it would actually be able to, again, increase the acetylcholine release. 
which will give you cholinergic side effects. Plus, again, it'll inhibit the AV node, which was what's beneficial in patients who have AFib. Why is it beneficial in those patients who have heart failure with a reduced TF? Because if we block the AV node, that's good in patients who have atrial fibrillation. Well, here's the other concept. Here on these contractile cells, so this is gonna be non-pacemaker cells. This is the non-pacemaker cells. These are the ones that are actually gonna contract. You have these channels here, these pumps, and what they do is they pump sodium out of the cell and they pump potassium into the cell. So they're gonna pump sodium out and they're gonna pump potassium into the cell, okay? That's the whole job. They're designed to be able to kind of maintain the nice gradient of keeping sodium high outside the cell, potassium in the cell, and they also maintain resting memory potential. We know that. But what's interesting is that if we give the joxin, what the joxin's gonna do is, is it inhibits these sodium potassium ATPases. So then the basic concept is that you're not gonna allow for sodium to move out of the cell and you're not gonna allow for potassium to move into the cell. So I can't get sodium out of the cell, okay? So if I can't get sodium out of the cell, there's a problem with that. So now I'm not gonna be able to get sodium out of the cell, but on the other end out of this situation here is I'm not gonna be able to get sodium out here into the extracellular space. All right, why is that important? Well now if I inhibit these pumps, what's gonna happen is my sodium inside of the cell is going to increase. And then I'm not gonna have as much sodium out here, okay, in the extracellular space. Well, you have these particular channels here, and they're very important in contractility. Sodium, naturally, if it's in a higher concentration outside of the cell, should flow into the cell, and then allow for the calcium to flow out of the cell, okay? But if I inhibit the sodium potassium ATPases, I inhibit the gradient from being formed, because naturally I want sodium to be higher outside the cell and lower inside the cell. So because of that, as a result, I'm going to cause this abnormality, high sodium in the cell, low sodium out of the cell. So now sodium won't enter into the cell down its concentration gradient. So this process is inhibited. And if sodium can't come into the cell, calcium can't go out of the cell. So that leads to calcium staying inside of the cell. If calcium stays inside of the cell, it activates particular types of myofilaments, so it'll activate different like things like calcium, calmodulin complexes, and cause the stimulation of the myofilaments and cause contraction. So the overarching effect here is that it will increase contractility. And that's why it's beneficial in those patients who have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. That's why we would give this. What's the downside though? If you give digoxin, it inhibits the sodium potassium pumps. So one of the downsides here a couple of them, is that if I inhibit the sodium potassium pump, I don't put, pump potassium into the cell. So what happens to the potassium level outside of the cell? If I can't pump the potassium back in, it builds up outside of the cell in the extracellular fluid, and I end up with hyperkalemia. So because I inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase, I can increase my potassium levels in the blood. Hyperkalemia is one effect. The second thing is that I increase calcium inside of these particular cells. When you increase calcium too much, way too much, you know what's the downside of that? If you increase intracellular fluid calcium levels, it can increase the risk of delayed after depolarizations. If you increase the risk of delayed after depolarizations triggered activity, this can cause VTAC. Oh my gosh, that's so terrible. So one of these drugs that's actually utilized to inhibit the AV node from kind of quickly depolarizing and also used to increase contractility, if it's in higher doses, it can cause too much calcium to be in those cells that they become triggered. And now they start firing. It can cause the patient to go into VTAC. One of the big things to remember here with the joxin is that the toxicity effect, the worsening hyperkalemia and worsening ventricular tachycardia that they can develop happens whenever the potassium levels are low or they have super therapeutic digoxin levels. So if you give them too much digoxin, it can cause hyperkalemia and it can cause VTAC. But you can actually increase the toxicity of digoxin whenever a patient has hypokalemia. So this digoxin toxicity, it's just important to remember that low potassium <clears throat> can increase digoxin toxicity. And the reason why is potassium normally competes with the joxin at the sodium potassium pumps.
But if you don't have as much potassium, you don't have the joxin competing with it anymore. And the joxin has no competition and it's just going to inhibit, 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 inhibit those sodium potassium ATPases. And so that will worsen this inhibition of the sodium potassium pumps. So yes, remember, this is one of those confusing things. The joxin can directly cause hyperkalemia by inhibiting the sodium potassium pumps. It can also cause intracellular calcium levels to be super high, which can increase the risk of delayed after depolarizations in the ventricular myocytes causing VTAC. But you can worsen the joxin toxicity in patients who are having hypokalemia. And then watch out that it can increase cholinergic side effects such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and blurry vision. Okay, now that we've talked about the joxin, one of the last things I want you to remember is how do we actually treat a patient? So we talked about these before with beta blockers. If a patient has a beta blocker overdose, we actually give something called glucagon. In calcium channel blocker overdoses, we give them calcium. In the joxin overdoses, we actually give them something called digibind. And it's one of these kind of monoclonal antibodies that actually bind onto the joxin and prevent it from causing its toxic effects. All right. Now that we've talked about this drug category, let's move on to the next one, which is your sodium channel blockers. All right, so next one, sodium channel blockers. This is again your class one or type one antiarrhythmic drugs. So these are gonna be utilized in patients who you want to cardiovert, who have atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, right? Or have some type of ventricular tachycardia, or they have torsades to points and you wanna shorten their actual potential duration. So when we talk about these drugs, what are some of the adverse effects that you wanna be careful of and cognizant of? Well, one of the big things is particularly the, the class 1A or type 1A antiarrhythmic drugs. So this is, again, your double quarter pounder. So disopyramide is quinidine, percanamide. What are the downsides to this drug class? Remember I told you that with all of these, they're going to block the sodium channels, okay? With type 1A or class 1A, they'll have moderate, so they'll be in the middle. So they'll, they'll have a decent sodium channel blockade. But what else did I tell you that they have? They also have a very weak potassium channel blockade. So because they block the potassium channels, they're going to prolong the refractory period. So you get two effects here. One is you decrease the slope of phase zero, but you also prolong the effective refractory period and increase the action potential duration. So my action potential duration is going to be increased in comparison. So here's the beginning, and here's the end for the, first, for the normal situation. Now here to the end of that blue line, that's the new action potential duration. It's increased. The problem with increasing action potential duration is it prolongs something on your EKG. So you know in your EKG, when you look at the EKG, you have your P wave, then you have what's called your Q, R, S, then you have your ST segment, and then you have what's called your T wave, okay? From this point here, <clears throat> it's actually doing a red. From this point here, from the Q wave, all the way here, <clears throat> this is called your QT interval. When the action potential duration is longer, your QT interval is longer. So this drug category, if they increase the action potential duration, they're going to increase the QT interval. What's the problem with increasing the QT interval? What did I tell you this increases the risk of? This increases the risk of something called early after depolarizations, which increases the risk of something called torsades to points. And with torsades to points, what you'll see is you'll see this like very freaky looking EKG <clears throat> where you'll see the QT interval getting longer, 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 and then eventually you'll start looking something like this where they have this very, very odd kind of like twisting of the points on their EKG. A very scary one. Don't want to see this. This will make you poop your huggies. So because of that, it's important to be able to realize that the double quarter pounder drugs, so disopyramide, quinidine, and procainamide, have the ability to increase the action potential duration, prolong the QT interval, and put these patients into torsades to points. That's one of the downsides of that. <clears throat> now, again, they work by doing what? Well, they work by blocking sodium influx moderately, and then they also work by blocking potassium efflux very mildly. And so because you have this kind of double action of the type 1A drugs, that is how you get this type of effect here, okay? So that's an important thing to remember. So the type 1A drugs, they're the only ones out of this drug category that increase the actual potential duration, increase the risk of torsades to points. Okay, what about some other additional types of problematic issues here? Because all we did was we took a piece of, a, of atrial ventricular tissue, zoomed in on it, and looked at how exactly we're inhibiting these, we're inhibiting sodium channels and potassium channels mildly with type 1A and we see how we get that increased action potential duration. Let's see that we take all the other drugs in this category, again, type 1A or class 1A. What are some additional adverse drug reactions besides them increasing the QT interval and increasing the risk of torsades? The other thing to remember is that disopyramide has what's called anticholinergic side effects. 
anticholinergic side effects. So watch out for that dry eyes, dry mouth, urinary retention, constipation, fevers, and uh, potentially, uh, again, with other anticholinergic effects, you may see like things like um, uh, tachycardia and hypertension, things to that effect, watch out for those anticholinergic side effects. Okay, with quinidine, one of the son of a gun, one of the big things that you want to watch out for with quinidine is this can cause something that's I hate the name of it because I never know if I'm saying it right. Synchronism. So synchronism you want to watch out for with this one, and this is usually when you have patients who have what's called like you know usually they have headaches, they have vertigo, they have some degree of tinnitus, they may have kind of like visual changes. So this is something that you want to watch out for with this particular drug category. Okay, so. <clears throat> with disopyramide, watch out for anticholinergic side effects. <clears throat> with quinidine, you want to watch out for synchronism. With procainamide, what you want to watch out for with this one is what's called drug-induced lupus. So drug-induced systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay? So class 1A, type 1A, they all increase your QT interval and increase the risk of torsades to points. Individually, Disopyramide can cause anticholinergic side effects. So again, this can cause things like delirium. It can cause them to have dry eyes, dry mouth. It can cause tachycardia, hypertension. It can cause fevers. It can cause urinary retention, constipation. Quinidine can cause synchronism, so headache, vertigo, tinnitus, visual changes. Procainamide can cause drug-induced lupus. Okay, with the type 1B, so this is lidocaine. Lidocaine's weird, to be honest with you. There's not much evidence of how exactly they do this, but remember that lidocaine can cause AV nodal blockade. Um, because it does have some sodium channel kind of blockade. But the other thing it can actually do is it can cause CNS depression or CNS stimulation. So which you're like, well, which one is it? So watch, it can cause CNS stimulation, which can increase the risk of seizures, but it can also cause CNS depression. And so watch out for things such as like somnolence and altered mental status and maybe even depression. Okay. The next one here is your type 1C or your class 1C. This is the fries, please. So flecainide um, and also propofenone. With these ones, one of the big things, and I already told you about this, if a patient has underlying coronary artery disease, they have underlying LVH, they have underlying uh, post-MI, or they have some type of um, another situation here such as heart failure, so they have CAD, LVH, MI, or they have heart failure, and you give them this drug, it can increase the risk of these patients developing very nasty arrhythmias. It's super, super prorhythmic. and it can increase the risk of going into V-fib and sudden cardiac death. So I think that's a pretty important one to remember. So in patients who have coronary artery disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, MI, heart failure, and you give them flecainide and propofenone, it is extremely prorhythmic and can increase the risk of, again, sudden cardiac death, patients going into ventricular fibrillation. So please be careful with that drug category. All right. We talked about sodium channel blockers. The last one that we got to discuss and we're done, guys, is the potassium channel blockers. All right, my friends, let's talk about the last one, potassium channel blockers. This is your amio, right? This is the um, abutilide. This is defetilide. This is going to be sodalol. And then we talked about dronetarone as an either lunch you can add in there. But when we talk about these drugs, we talked about how they're used to be able to treat things like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, particularly more in cardioverting these patients, so getting them out of that abnormal rhythm in those re-entrant cycles or in those patients who have kind of like the triggered activity in their atria. Because again, what you're trying to do is suppress that. We can also use things like amiodarone and sodalol in patients who have ventricular tachycardias. So again, triggered activity or re-entrant circuits within the ventricular tissue. When we give these drugs, what are the things that you have to watch out for? So if I give someone amiodarone or if I give someone any of these drugs, all of these drugs have the ability to prolong the QT interval, like the type 1A or class 1A drugs. How do they do that? Well, remember, with these drugs, they're particularly blocking. If we take a piece of this kind of like ventricular tissue here and we zoom in on it here, we're going to have these potassium channels. And these potassium channels are going to be allowing for potassium to exit during what phases again? Phase 1, phase 2, phase 3. Basically, again, you have phase 0, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, and then we go to phase 4, right? Well, what happens here is when you block or you inhibit, when you give potassium channel blockers, you inhibit the potassium channels. You don't allow for the potassium to exit the cell easily. And so because of that, what you start to notice is you have a normal slope, but you have a very prolonged effective refractory period. 
And so you're increasing the distance of your effective refractory period. Super long, right? And so because of that, your effective refractory period increases. But then on top of that, the action potential duration from this point here to this point here is significantly increased. So you have an increase in your action potential duration. And what do we say happens if you increase action potential duration, you increase the QT interval. If you increase the QT interval, you increase the risk of early after depolarizations, which increase the risk of torsades to points, which is an arrhythmia that will cause you to poop your huggies, we said. So that's an important concept. Because again, we're prolonging the amount of potassium that's leaving during phase one, phase two, phase three. So we're prolonging that entire refractory period. More pro profound effect on phase two and phase three, though, is what you're gonna see. So because of that, all of these drugs, all the age drugs, amiodarone, abutilide, defetilide, dronetarone, um, and sotalol have the ability to increase the QT interval and increase the risk of torsades to points. So remember that. All right. So it would be important if these patients developed torsades to points or they had developed a very prolonged QT interval, think about discontinuing those drugs to prevent them from going into torsades. But if they went into torsades, how do we treat it again? We discontinue those medications, we give them magnesium, we give them one of the antiarrhythmics that shortens the action potential duration, such as lidocaine, and we can also consider things like pacing or isoproteranol to increase their heart rate. Either way, what are some other things to think about? So all of these drugs, they increase the QT interval, but it's really amiodarone if it's utilized long-term that is the one that you'll likely be tested on for the boards. Amiodarone is a great drug acutely, but using it long-term, there is some downsides to this drug. One of the things here is it can cause interstitial lung disease. So it has the ability to cause interstitial lung disease. So because of that, because it can cause all this fibrosis, it's important to be able to monitor the patient's PFTs and watch out for any increased risk of interstitial lung disease. Amiodarone can also cause destruction of the thyroid tissue, but it's also amiodarone has a lot of iodine in it. Like 40% of the structure of, of amiodarone is iodine. So it can also be taken up into these actual thyroid tissues and be utilized to make thyroid hormone. So you can see two effects here. One is you can see low T3 and low T4, but you can also see high T3 and T4. So it's important to be able to monitor the patient's thyroid function test as well. Let's actually do these in red here. So again, it can cause interstitial lung disease, so monitor PFTs, so check their PFTs to watch out for increased risk of that. It can also cause hypo or hyperthyroidism, so monitor their thyroid function test to check for that. It also can cause fibrosis of the liver. So it can cause some hepatotoxicity, causing there to leak out a lot of ALT, AST molecules. So you want to be able to check their LFTs for any types of hepatotoxicity that they can cause. You know what else this drug can do? It can actually prolong the QT interval, just like the, all the other ones. So it's important to be able to get EKGs on patients who are taking any of the class three drugs and get EKGs on the type 1A drugs. But the other thing is, this is another one, this is a son of a gun here. It can actually cause bluish discoloration and deposition in the skin and around the actual cornea. So watch for any bluish discoloration. So watch for any bluish discoloration or patchiness of the skin, of the skin and eyes. These are some of the things that you have to watch out for with amiodarone. Great drug short term, not a great one long term. Okay, so with that being said, potassium channel blockers, they all can prolong your QT interval, so make sure that you check a EKG on these patients to monitor that QT interval and prevent them from going into torsades to points. Long-term amiodarone, big thing to watch out for here with this one, interstitial lung disease, watch out for PFTs, Hypo, hyperthyroidism, so check their TFTs, uh, hepatotoxicity and hepatitis, so LFT checks, and then bluish, skin dis uh, bluish discoloration of the skin and eyes, watch out for that as well. Again, if you want to think about the other ones, dronetarone, very, very also, um, you can see some hepatotoxicity with that one. Um, the other thing is um, with Sotolol, Sotolol has a little bit of a beta blocker activity, so you may see some beta blocker kind of effects with that one as well. But nonetheless, that covers the potassium channel blocker adverse drug reactions, and that covers our antiarrhythmic drug classes, all their mechanisms, how we use them, everything. So now let's do a couple cases and really reinforce everything that we learned. All right, engineers, let's go ahead and do some actual questions here. So we have a patient, a 60 year old woman, um, had a myocardial infarction, so she's post MI. Which agent should be used to prevent life threatening arrhythmias that can occur post MI in this patient? 
So digoxin, no, digoxin is not gonna be utilized. There's no indication for digoxin post MI for reducing arrhythmias. <clears throat> if a patient had a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and AFib, it actually may be beneficial, but no, not for post MI. Um, that's not really an indication for it. Flecainide, no, absolutely not. It's actually proarrhythmic, especially in patients who are post MI, so don't do that. Um, Atoprolol, absolutely, it's a beta blocker. Any kind of beta blocker is really good post MI because it, again, it reduces a lot of the excessive ectopy um, that you can see with patients who um, have some type of underlying heart disease and increase kind of like PVCs from a lot of the re-entrant circuits from that post MI scar tissue. Um, it also helps to be able to prevent any kind of excessive like delayed after depolarization. So in general, beta blockers are really good at suppressing any kind of like VTAC or PVCs that could be non-sustained in patients who are post MI. Plus it reduces a lot of like abnormal cardiac remodeling in patients who are post MI, reducing the risk of, you know, problematic issues downstream from that, like mortality and morbidity. So definitely going to be metoprolol. Percanamide, again, has no indication for really post-MI patients with increased risk of arrhythmias. So if they put like lidocaine or something like that, then that'd be a different story. But again, it's got to be metoprolol here. All right. So that should be the answer for this puppy. All right. Good. Next one. 57-year-old man is being treated um, for an atrial arrhythmia. He complains of dry mouth, blurred vision, urinary hesitancy. Um, which antiarrhythmic drug is he most likely taking? Um, so it sounds like kind of like cholinergic side effects in this situation here, right? So in patients who have lots of acetylcholine release, what happens? Um, when you have lots of acetylcholine release, generally that causes kind of like a lot of changes, like in this case, it would actually cause increased like the secretions. Um, it would actually cause um, these patients to have lots of urinary frequency in situations like that. But in this patient, they're dry, so we're probably blocking the acetylcholine effect here. So you're seeing like an anticholinergic property of a drug because it's preventing secretions from the mouth, so that's why they're having dry mouth, and it's causing urinary hesitancy. So that could be due to like a retention effect. So that's definitely an anticholinergic effect. Metoprolol is a beta blocker. It doesn't really have any kind of anticholinergic effect here. Um, disopyramide is a type 1 um, A sodium channel blocker. And disopyramide does actually have um, anticholinergic properties. We mentioned that on the whiteboard. So disopyramide is likely the right answer. Dronetarone. No, it doesn't have any, it can have some patotoxic effects and increased risk of mortality, especially if the patient has like heart failure and things of that nature. But no, dronetarone doesn't really have any kind of anticholinergic and neither does sotolol. So with that being said, I'm definitely going to say disopyramide for the correct answer here. All right, 78-year-old <clears throat> woman has newly been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. She's not currently having any symptoms of palpitations or fatigue, which is appropriate to initiate for rate control as an outpatient. So rate control is primarily beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or digoxin if they have heart failure with a reduced EF. So they don't have digoxin. There's no calcium channel blocker that's mentioned here, so it's got to be a beta blocker. So dronetarone is not going to be the right answer because that's a type 3. It's a potassium channel blocker. Asmola is a beta blocker, but, and you would think that would be the right answer. But we also have metoprolol. What's the difference? Metoprolol is primarily, it can be given IV, but it can also be given PO. So you can give this as an outpatient. Esmolol is primarily IV. So because I can't put this patient on an IV infusion um, of Esmolol, I'd have to do an oral agent outpatient, especially for rate control. So metoprolol would be the correct answer. And again, flecainide is not going to be the right answer because it's more for rhythm um, control. So it's designed to be able to allow for maintaining a patient in normal sinus rhythm and preventing them from converting back into paroxysmal AFib. So it maintains normal sinus rhythm in patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation without any underlying coronary artery disease or LVH or heart failure. So it's definitely not going to be flecainide. It's not dronetarone. It's not esmolol because it's IV. It's definitely got to be metoprolol. Which of the following is correct regarding digoxin when used for atrial fibrillation? It works by blocking voltage-gated sensitive calcium channels? No. It increases acetylcholine release from the vagus nerve, which actually helps to allow for potassium efflux. So that's not the correct answer. B is used for rhythm control. It's actually only used for rate control. So it suppresses and blocks the AV node and reduces the amount of electrical activity from the atria into the ventricles, reduces the rapid ventricular rates, actually. So that's not the right answer. Digoxin increases conduction. No, it actually decreases conductor velocity through the AV node. So that leaves the last answer, which is D, which is the correct answer, obviously, because it's the last one that's available. But it's the right answer because if we approach this particular serum level, this is the appropriate level which allows for us to suppress the AV node as well as give a positive inotropic effect without causing any digoxin toxicity or allowing for it to be at subtherapeutic levels. So this is a proper kind of like therapeutic index of this drug of one to two. As you get lower, subtherapeutic as you go above, you increase risk of toxicity. All of the following are adverse effects of amiodarone except 
<laughs> synchronism is actually seen with um, quinidine. So that can't be the right answer because that's the headaches, the tinnitus, and those types of problems. Hypothyroidism is definitely seen with amiodarone. Remember, we got to watch out for that. And hyperthyroidism, pulmonary fibrosis, absolutely. And blue skin discoloration as well as even of the eyes. So yeah. So the only one that actually is not the correct answer is synchronism, which is actually seen in particularly quinidine. So it's going to be A. Which arrhythmia can be treated with lidocaine? So it's going to be patients who are post-MI um, who have an increased risk of ventricular tachycardia or they have VTAC. So they go into VTAC and they just were post-MI. That would be the particular indication for this. So paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, nope, that's not a VTAC. Atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, those are all supraventricular. They're all atrial stuff. So it's got to be VTAC D. A clinician would like to initiate a drug for rhythm control of atrial fibrillation, which of the following uh, coexisting conditions would allow for initiation of flecainide hypertension? That's absolutely uh, you know, appropriate. So if a patient is going to be put on flecainide, which is a type 1C, that's that pill-in-the-pocket approach to atrial fibrillation. In other words, you're trying to keep a patient in normal sinus rhythm, maintaining their normal sinus rhythm, and a patient who has paroxysmal AFib, no permanent AFib, it's paroxysmal AFib, and you're trying to maintain them in normal sinus rhythm in the outpatient population. They don't have any coronary artery disease slash ischemic heart disease. They don't have any left ventricular hypertrophy. They don't have any heart failure. If they have none of those things, then you can utilize this drug. If they have those things, you increase the risk of arrhythmias and putting them into sudden cardiac death. So hypertension is the only appropriate answer here. All right, that would conclude all of these questions here on the antiarrhythmics. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys liked it. And as always, love you. Thank you. Until next time, Ninja Nerds.